I'll have mine in gold and silver, please. And I'll bypass that bank. Thank you. Coming to you live from Studio C at the Lighthouse in Southeast Georgia at Free America Radio Network in the land of dreams, enchantments, and nightmares. It's Money, Banking, and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. Your solutions-oriented program on public policy and the entire alphabet soup of crazy that is made sense by Kristen Walter. how you can get the quid pro quo, we're giving you something. 
free of charge, but we would love a love gift and support. Thank you to all of you who send in your 5, your 10, your 20, okay? And the fun. We appreciate it. Money!
no matter what, we're here to stay. We're here for the long haul until they pull that proverbial plug. And so, Christian, on with the program. Well, have you told them how to uh, make a donation at all? Uh... Well, okay, if they want to uh, make a donation, for instance, if they want to get this program uh, tomorrow morning, we could send it by file transfer. If they want to tag us on Skype, uh, they can, uh, they can, or Skype in, or if they want to ask questions during programming and they don't want to talk on the phone, they can Skype me and I'll be glad to read their question. Uh, our, our Skype in name on the phone, uh, instant messenger is Free America Network. One word, Free America Network. And you'll see we're in Kingsland, Georgia. Just hit me up and I'll be glad to accept and you'll be in our phone book. And then uh, at the same time, uh, we can do a file transfer of the audio of this programming tomorrow morning. Uh, and, uh, or, yeah, because I won't, I won't download it probably till the morning, but we'll be good to go. You can go to PayPal, go to the archive page, and it, it tells you right there, gives you instructions on how to follow through. And when you make your PayPal donation, put right on there what you're looking for, uh, you know, Christian, Pro, uh, Christian Walters, uh, Money Banking and Trust, or any program we do, you can get the file transfer audio by the click of a button. And um, we, we just were not able to burn CDs for people. That has uh, been a killer for us because I'm a one-man operation over here, and I just uh, have too many things going on with producing the network. And, uh, and I'm also doing my translations now and the Real Da Vinci Code Dictionary. Uh, we're trying to provide something of quality and substance that people uh, would enjoy you know, and, and value. And I'm literally making history uh, by doing the translation of the 114 sayings of Christ in the, uh, in the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas out of the Nag Hammadi Library and the Greek uh, text. And if, when any, I would be glad for any size, any size donation along with the audio here tonight. Uh, send the sample of the translation, and it will have the comparable other modern-day translations you know, in there, so you can compare what the Prashitu Targum restoration transliteration is all about versus the modern, and there is no comparison. Uh, I have been uh, enlightened into uh, ancient uh, thought and metaphor, symbol, and word etymology, the root form, and, and, it, and it all comes together. I literally defy the modern translators right now, and I'm making history, so it's profound. And the Real Da Vinci Code Dictionary, what is also called the Thesar Rule, the Thesar Rule has the original thought in it from the ancient past in our modern diction, as well as uh, all of these different occult legal terms, you know, and uh, and a whole lot more. So so you want to want to have an experience, you know, and see something you've never seen before. Hit us up on uh, the uh, the urgent tab or the archive uh, page or on the uh, on the uh, contact page and let us know what you're looking for. You can email us on the contact page. Scroll to the bottom. And also, we've got the Daily Nebula. If anybody wants to check out some beautiful uh, stellar, uh, you know, phenomena, every day they change those pictures on the uh, top right, uh, top left up there near the Urgent tab, the Daily Nebula. Okay. So uh, thanks for your support and for uh, and welcome to all of our new listeners, especially those out in England. It's a real uh, pleasure and uh, quite an enigma to have uh, you know uh, the British tuning in, tuning in, trying to find the solutions. I thought I thought it was Brit here the British are looking to the Americans now for the solution. Uh, rather ironic, isn't it, Christian? What a time we live in. Uh, yeah, uh, they're listening in on what we're doing over here, and uh, really our, our source is really them anyway, so it really fits. Right. But uh, I'd like to welcome everyone today for... Uh, yeah, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold your thought. Before you do it, I'm going to try to boost you one more time. I still think you're too low. Come on, give me six more sixes. Well, I'm, I'm over-modulating on this end. Over-modulating on that end? Yeah. You got a meter? Yeah. Well, okay, it's not, it's not, it can't be uh, in tune with us then because you're still low over here. Try, must, try hitting a little more. Must, must be a line then, bad line or something. Are you, are you simulcast on uh, what, on another uh, stream? No, just dialing in on. Okay, in other words, you're not like on talk show or anything like that, right? Ah, no, no. Okay, well, just hit six uh, and uh, just a couple. That's it, so. Oh, okay, very good. You're, you're good, Christian. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pegging the meter on my end, so. Okay, you're good here. All right, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this Saturday, January 30th, 2010 edition of Money Banking and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. I'm your host, Christian Walters, and welcome to uh, NTT, New Trust Technology, utilizing the Moving Titles and Commerce platform. So I've announced the Moving Titles and Commerce workshop earlier uh, this uh, couple weeks ago, I believe it was, 16th, I believe, of this January here. So shortly I'll be sending out the, the uh, applications for registration, so I haven't sent them out. So if anybody out there hasn't gotten one, don't feel like you've been left out because 
I still haven't sent them out yet, so so you just sit still, be patient. But uh, yes, since we introduced NTT Workshop there, based on the Moving Titles platform, uh, a bit short on time, so you know, keep me uh, on the back of your mind for you know requests and things, because uh, I really just don't have the time to respond to everybody, so I'm really swamped. So the uh, Moving Tiles platform, we've been working on that as the new remedy in technology, as NTT is new trust technology. So when we get this uh, rolling here, I think we're going to be really into some successes once we get it going. I've got some things that I have to announce, but uh, I'm not going to announce them just yet. Uh, I want to check it out a little further, but some good news. But uh, I'm going to hold it back just for right now. But you know what? What is the Moving Titles platform? Maybe I should explain that for some of the newcomers. So, in order to help people understand the A through Z concepts that are out there today in this arena, I've come up with a more simplified way of understanding it all, and a simplified way of looking at everything as a title in the public that represents the real thing in the private. And that title is moved through the understanding of the technology that we use to move that title from one account to another, because. That's all we're really doing today in commerce. So this technology's recognition is the Moving Titles platform. So it's pretty basic. It involves UCC as different from what we've been accustomed to using UCC as, ones and threes. For we're using the ones to claim the titles, and we're using the threes to move the titles in a non-UCC fashion. And I think that is really confusing to a lot of people, because they're coming from a UCC background of using UCC differently from how we're using it under new trust technology. And that, that's going to be a kind of a stumbling block for people to get their mind around, because they're associating what they know from the past of UCC and incorporating that knowledge into this new trust technology, NTT, and it's not. It's not. Forget about everything you've known about UCC and filing, because we're not using the UCC to file the same way under UCC. We're just using UCC 1s and 3s to create a record, proof that we did something, that we claimed the title and that we own it. And then from once we've established ownership on the UCC 1, then it's ours, and we can now assign it or move it on a UCC 3. And we're creating a record on each phase. And that phase of the record creation is what we need to really prove the expression of the trust. Because the trust is expressed or comes in existence the moment you transfer a current trust property into the hands of the trustee. So you have to be able to prove when you made the transfer. And the transfer could have happened, say, three years prior, but yet you just finally got around to, say, recording it and making it a record and making it official. It becomes non pro tonk or all the way back to the beginning, whenever it was transferred, even though it might be three or four years or whatever later on. So that's the moving titles platform, basically. So now what is... NTT as new trust technology. Well, everybody knows the trusts are not new. Trusts have been around for hundreds of years. So while studying trust, I've recognized the powerful secret, the secret implementation of trust and its use. The result of this study has emerged this revolutionary technology, which I call NTT, and that stands for new trust technology. Now, as I've mentioned, trust has been around for quite a long time. So the recognition of the straw man is, is relatively new also, but the particular application of the straw man trust in terming the particular application of the straw man trust we got a lot of noise in the background here, so but the particular application of the straw man trust in terminating the trust uh, along with the claiming and the disbursement of all the huge assets held under the trust is a quantum leap in technology. And also how trusts are used to enslave those who do not know or understand that trusts are deceiving the people into volunteering as slaves by a lack of understanding. And the secret is that no party in the trust needs to know or understand that a trust is being formed. And that's truly amazing. So it's that no party in the trust needs to know that a trust is being formed. That's the truly amazing thing. And that's right out of the Gilbert's Law Summaries book that we've been studying trust on page 19. And that's also on the section 23 of the Restatement of Seconds of the Law of Trust. 
So if you want to, you can check that out. So knowing who you are is not being a secured party creditor through a debtor-creditor relationship, but only first through a trust relationship as grantor. It is knowing who you are as grantor. So this revolutionary concept, and we need to know and understand a trust in order to act in expressing and claiming a trust by proving the trust, and we need to go to the next level then and learn how to administer the trust. And if we don't, we're going to be right back voluntarily, volunteering into slavery by commingling the private trust with the public side again. So this Moving Titles and Commerce workshop is going to be a work in progress where together we're going to address these issues. And people attending the Moving Titles and Commerce workshop will assemble their own documents, word by word, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, so that they know and understand them. And it's a workshop where they work and have access to more in-depth information and guidance in a, through me and my knowledge and understanding of the specific topic or the challenges that people face today. And the pricing on that is that the relationship with the Moving Titles and Commerce workshop and me is not free. To join this private workshop study group and have access to myself is $299 per workshop. And this is explained fully on my website, which is the website link is, if you punch in your browser at the top, uh, movingtitles.com, it should pop up the page with the full explanation of option one, which is the one workshop price at $299, and option two is purchasing two successive workshops for a grand total of $4,898, which is a savings of $100 on two successive workshops. So each workshop includes your worldwide web access on a webinar desktop access by computer, which is a must. You've got to have a computer, and you can access that anywhere in the world. And we're going to hold these usually going to be on uh, tentatively set for Monday evenings and uh, Thursday evenings at 10 p.m. Eastern. So you have to have a phone access into each workshop also, and each workshop session is going to be for two hours per session and two sessions per week and for five weeks totaling 20 hours, and that equals one workshop. So that price includes all the access to the past show recordings that are recorded for personal study, and registration is required. Uh, the payment method will be released along with a start date sometime here in February, and tentatively, like I said, it's set for Monday and two Thursdays at, say, 10 p.m. Eastern time. And you must have the Gilbert's Law Summaries Trust by Edward C. Halback, Jr., the copyright 2008 vision, which is what I'm using, by Thompson West, and that's approximately $28. And also get a Black's Law 8th edition, or I guess they have a new one out, a 9th edition. And if you're really serious about this, I'd suggest getting a hard copy of that. Otherwise, uh, I suppose a paperback would suffice. And also the Uniform Commercial Code with the official comments official text and comments, and that's by Thompson, Thomas, Thompson West also. And these books are in addition to the workshop price, and you must order them separately. So you must request a registration application from me at nttregistration at movingtitles.com. Again, that's nttregistration at movingtitles.com. Send me a request for a registration form. So then in addition to this show, I also have a trust ambassador call on Monday, which is more of a private call. If you want to be a trust ambassador, you could join that group. But the trust ambassador requires that the person form a group under him of about 12 people and be willing to teach them and pass that information through to them. And I'm going to pick my, say, 12, and I'm going to be teaching those 12, and those 12 are going to have their 12 and everybody needs to be passing it along. So that's really, in order to qualify for a trust ambassador, you can you have to be a, a be willing to teach somebody else. <clears throat> so Tuesday I have a call that is an open call. And the Tuesday call-in number is uh, 712-432. 0075. Again, that number is 712-432-0075, and the PIN access code is 917030.
pound. Again, that number pin number is nine one seven zero three zero pound. That's the Tuesday call at ten p.m. Eastern. And Wednesday I have a talk show call at eight p.m. Eastern. And the talk show number is seven two four 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 seven four four four. And the pin access for that one is four one eight seven five pound. And I believe you have to put a one pound after that also. So that's that's on talk show at eight. So so keep checking back with the movingtitles.com website for updates. I'm going to put the audio links up there so you can have access to the audios through that and any new announcements and documentation, uh, interesting information. I'm trying to gear that site solely for trust and trust only, although there will be some debtor creditor stuff on there from the past that we've done because I've come from a debtor creditor position. I know what what's happening under debtor creditor there. And debtor creditor is really nothing but more than UCC or law merchant under negotiable instruments. But this site is geared more towards trust, and trusts are non-negotiable instruments, and it's operating in trust in equity and not under debtor-creditor under the UCC, although we use UCC as a reference. Okay, so. I don't know, maybe we might put it in an early open session tonight for question and answers. Uh, maybe some people want some special things talked about. Uh, well, we get, we've got somebody with a raised hand already, Christian. Yeah. Go ahead and open up. To, we'll try maybe a different little format here. And, okay. We're talking to our friends out there in England already. Got Matt tuned in, and uh, even got uh, we got Liberty Forum tuned in. Our Sunday program, listening to you right now as well. And uh, Jay out there, and somebody's trying to get me on my cell phone. My sponsor. I can't talk right now, Betty. Sorry. We're taking calls. <laughs> On uh, let's go with DP in Atlanta, Georgia. DP, good to have you on the uh, Money Banking and Trust program. I'm in DP. Well, maybe DP didn't mean to raise his hand, or maybe he didn't think we'd be asking questions this soon. Okay, DP going once, going twice. Come in, DP, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, we're going to mute you back out, DP, and feel free to come back. And anybody else with a comment or a question, you're going to have to raise your hand. Let's see if we've got one from out there across the big water. Okay, you got them unprepared, Christian. They were probably taking notes. Yeah, um, probably so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, if anybody has a comment or a question for Christian Walters, then you just simply hit star 5. Star 5 will raise your hand. I'll see it, and I'll be glad to uh, take your take your call, okay? All right, we've got one here. It's uh, area code 225. Please state your first name and where you're calling from. This is Terry in Louisiana. Hi, Terry. Good to have you. Thanks. I have a question for you, Christian. Um... How would you approach a potential employer with regard to not working under a W-2? In other words, how do you establish yourself as a non-resident alien? Uh, we on the last Tuesday call of this this week earlier, we kind of went over like an A through Z model or how we're going to be using. Uh, it's it's like that would be like a, the issue on a leaf on a tree that keeps on coming back and haunting you all the time because if you pull that leaf off, you know, another leaf comes back real quick and takes its place. But the way to solve the problem is, hey, you, you pull the tree out by the root, and that's what we're talking about doing. Because your, your problem is with the tree keeps on producing more leaves and you can't pull the leaves off all the time, uh, so the problem is, you know, get to the source and pull the root of the tree out. And that's what we're explaining. We're going to take over the whole account. We're disconnecting from everything. We're terminating the main straw man account from start to finish, and that's going to kill all the leaves. And that's, that's okay. what I'm, I'm gearing towards. Rather than to try to fight each individual issue or each individual leaf tree as it comes out, I'm pulling the whole, the whole thing right out. So really your, your problem is not, you know, how do I treat that employee? It's like I'm getting totally out of the system, and then I'm going to jack back in through an LLC from the, from the private side and be totally control of both sides of the ledger from there through trust. It all comes from trust using the new trust technology. Okay, so you, you're not quite ready to, uh, or we're not quite ready to take on that sort of an employer uh, to accommodate 
being working in the workplace right now yeah, under the trust? Yeah, I think if we do, uh, you, the effect might not be like if we pulled the whole thing out because you could maybe throw some paperwork in there and it seems like, you know, they're coming right back at it and not, not honoring the paperwork. You see, because the, the problem is in the individual master file in the IRS, you put yourself down as trustee and trustee is the debtor. So you've appointed right. yourself for your status to be trustee on the account, which is really in conflict to, say, as being beneficiary on a Social Security account. So that master file does not jive with all of the records out there, and they look at that as being inconsistent, and that means that you're incompetent. And therefore, they're still putting you under the discretionary trust, and they have discretion whether to use any kind of information or withhold or do payments or whatever. Because basically, we're still acting like children, because we don't understand what's going on. Um, all right, so we're just not quite ready yet, so for the time being, go ahead as a W-2 and uh, bide our time, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, until we get the, uh, the actual documentation perfected to close everything down and terminate the whole account. Okay, great, thanks. Anybody else? Desert? Okay, let's see who we have here. We've got, uh, let's see. Okay, we've got a couple more here. Let's see. Uh, well, sir, are you... Uh, Raise your hand again, so I assume you don't want your hand raised, so I'm going to undo your hand. Uh, hit star star five again, Terry. Should, that should drop your hand, so there's no confusion here. And we've got um, Carlos in California. Good to have you, Carlos. Yes, sir. How are you, guys? Good. How okay, are you? Hit six about three times. Six okay. about three times, Carlos. You're pretty good, but boosted a little more. Better? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi, Christian. Good. How, How are you, Christian? I have, a, I have a funny one. Well, not a funny one. It's a new one for me. I have a, someone related to our family that's, that turned 18 yesterday. It's my wife's sister, son, uh, nephew. Anyway, he's uh, handicapped. He's, he suffers from mongolism. Uh, so obviously he's handicapped. How are we going to approach on, on collapsing his trust? Somebody who's the, the uh, overseer of him is going to have to do it for him. Yes, obviously, right. Uh, it's going to be a little easier because, I mean, his social security hasn't been tampered with or his his name and his social security. It's going to be easier, right? I would think so because he hasn't created anything out there on his own signature. Right, right. So basically we'll just follow the same rules and his uh, his father is going to have to do it, obviously, for him, right? Right. Uh-huh. Okay. We don't see any problem there? No, I don't because the fact that he's disabled. legal guardian knows him and he obviously he can't do it for himself. Yeah, obviously, yeah, but he has the same rights as uh, anybody else, obviously, right? Because he's, uh, he's got his Social Security, so I don't see any problem, right? Yeah, he has the right to have and to hold, uh, but he doesn't have the right to administer the trust. Right, yes, yes. That's going to be his uh, his guardian, which is his father. Okay, good enough. Now, <clears throat> that's one. I have another one. I have a, a personal commercial loan. I, I, I have a, a property that I had... had free and clear, I took out $400,000 out of there, and I bought four properties. And uh, I invested those, those, uh, that money in those four properties. They're generating some money, which is fine. It's perfectly. My question is this. Can I express that trust, but the, on the deed, I have three persons who hold title to that, to that loan. And on that deed, it says that so-and-so, uh, owns some percentage of that note. Did they generate the money the same way a uh, regular loan g generated uh, or a regular loan the bank generated? Am I clear? Well, uh, I mean three times the amount? N no. On, on that on that uh, note, on that grant deed, on the note, three persons allegedly lent the money. Three persons put up the money Lend them. for the bank to give me the loan. So on, on that on my documents, I have 23 percent to one person, uh, 20 something percent to another, and another. And the bank has a small percentage. So basically, I'm paying four persons or four accounts the the amount that I borrowed from them. But my question is this: Did the bank also made money when I signed the note and they monetized it, or did they just take? And then how would I find out if they just took the money from these uh, investors and gave it to me? Obviously, I think that the bank 
monetize also the notes? That's my question. Yeah, that's uh, obviously they're still treating it as a trust. The, that note went into a special deposit, but then you still abandoned it, and they've securitized it. Right. So the bank, the bank took the money from these investors. They gave it to me, and also monetized my notes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How would I find out uh, I'm true on that or not? Or not? Uh, I think if you tracked back through the S3 registrations and uh, found out how that tied back in the the 424 B uh, call report, reports and uh, the prospectus and that, find out you know the it can be tracked back to that. So so it is, is it a foreclosure now? No, 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 no. It's it's current. But I, I would like to collapse that trust. I live out of that property. That property supports me because it's rented out, but I took a loan to, to make another investment. Yeah, well, but I would go back to the source of, you know, who signed the documents. That, that person was the grantor, and whoever put the signature on, on, on the notes, you know, that's, that's the uh, grantor right there. Okay. Yeah, like, like I said, it's a loan I took out on, on my name, and three investors and the bank are the beneficiaries of that note. Yeah, I would express that as being a, a trust and, and prove the trust. Right, exactly. That's, that's my question. Was I going to be able, and could I prove them that they also monetize my note, the one that I signed? And going on a trust basis, I don't really uh, you're, you're have not worry about prove that. that they monetize the note, because I'm going to treat the note as gone into special deposit, as in-kind in and in-kind back out. So if it went in under special deposit under trust, and I'm going to call it back. I'm going to recall the note. If they can't recall the note and give it back to me after it's been recalled, I mean, if they can't give it back to me, then obviously they've done something other than the note then kept it in special deposit. So it makes no difference to me what they've done with the note. If they can't give the note back, that's proof that they've commingled the funds. And a commingling of funds is a conversion. Yeah, I think it's 320-something, right? 336? Yeah, nine dash three thirty six. Yep, commingling. Yes, right, right. Commingling okay. is conversion also, and that's a cause of action to come against the bank at for breach of trust, conversion, commingling. Right, right. Uh, going back to three thirty six. Now, so really, so the I don't have thing to that I prove that they securitized the note. All I have to do is give an order to give me the note back because it was held in trust as a special deposit. If they can't give me the note back, that proves they don't have it, which means they commingled. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that I should do is request my note or a copy of a note. I, I'm still paying that loan. I, I still owe like $396,000. It's only about a year old, and I'm current. And I don't have a problem, but if I can express the note and find out and make sure that nobody else has that note out there, and I don't have uh, five guys owning my property. and I So basically, going to number, step number one, I should yes claim a copy of that note, right? Original, genuine, an alternate note. Yeah. That's the, uh, right? the, the signature on the note proves that you're the grantor. Because yes. Coming back to that one case that we came across, uh, Nevada, bankruptcy, and I forget uh, the name of it now, but anyway, in there, one of the footnotes, like foot number 30, footnote 32, it said that uh, under Nevada revised code statutes under 107.202, that it said that in that bankruptcy, uh, that bankruptcy court judge said that the signer of the note was the trustor, and that was right out of the revised code statutes. Right. Yeah, I I, I remember that. And everybody should have that that in their own state somewhere codified something similar to that. And that's why I mentioned to everybody needs to search your local states and find out where that comports to under that Nevada one, because. That is your law that you can prove that the signer on the note was the trustor, he said. And the trustor is the same as the grantor. So that yeah. is a statutory fact that you can prove that if you signed the note, that proves you're the grantor on it. Right. And that's why everybody right. needs to go in their own states and check out where that comports to in their own states out of that revised code, revised code statutes and out of that bankruptcy federal case. Okay. Do you do you remember that uh, the date on that case, or it was a Nevada case, right? Yeah, I know it's a Nevada case. I, I got it here. Should be sitting here. Yeah, 
that we can find that case uh, case file and then get a certified copy on that and put it in our toolbox. I know I'm doing this uh, uh, debtor creditor, but for now I have to do it this way until I'm ready to express the trust until I finish the whole seminar or the bootcamp that we're gonna start next month. Kristen, you ready for next one? No, I just found this here. It is. Okay. Okay, let's see. And I want to welcome our uh, new listeners out there, and we just got tagged by Dominique in uh, Ireland, so we've just opened up Ireland uh, to our radio network uh, since we had uh, Martin Tucson doing uh, the uh, prison outreach ministry over there in Belfast. So I want to welcome our Ireland listeners and even Australia. We got tagged by Australia. Uh, this week, want to welcome our, our listeners over there. So we're really growing on an international level. We do a program, by the way, from South Africa uh, every uh, Saturday. Uh, uh, Simon Prophet couldn't be on today. He had a power problem, but we'll have him on next week. So we got South Africa, then Canada opens prior to Christian Walters. So we really are an international network, ladies and gentlemen. We find out that we've got more in common with our international friends than we do differences. Uh, I think all these nations are nothing but imaginations. I think borders, we need to pull the boards down because uh, that's all an illusion. Kristen? Okay, this is a uh, United States Bankruptcy Court District of Nevada case, uh, March 31st, 2009, so it's fairly recent. Uh, the case is Henry Joshua and Stephanie Mitchell. Henry Joshua and Stephanie Mitchell. And it's a bankruptcy case, uh, BK S 07 1626-LBR, Chapter 7 case. And it states in uh, footnote 31, it says, Nevada recognizes that parties may secure the performance of an obligation or the payment of a debt by means of a deed of trust. And it says, Nevada Revised Code Statutes, Sections 107.020, says the maker of the note is the trustor and the payee is the beneficiary. So that statute says that the signer on the note is the grantor, period, statutorily wise. They've got to recognize that. And now we need to right. go and find out where, where that comports to in your, say, local state and find out where that Nevada Revised Code statute comports to your local state because that's going to be the law you're going to pull up to say the law says that the signer on the note is the grantor. Now, if there's a grantor, there's got to be a trust, a trust on the note. And he also said in that case that the payee is the beneficiary. So the bank is the beneficiary because that's who the notes are usually made out to. So there's your proof for your starting point. There's one of your witnesses right there to prove that there was a trust formed. The signature on the... Major witness. Yes, I'm sorry. It's a major witness. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll, I'll let somebody else speak. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. That's it. Okay, we got another question then? Yeah, Christian, let's... Uh, we got some hands up. Okay. Okay, we've got Rhonda in... Misery, state of misery. Go ahead, Rhonda. How you doing? Can you hear me? Go ahead, Rhonda. How's the snakes out there? Is that better? Yeah, it's a little better. Go ahead, Rhonda. Hi. Uh, Christian, if the uh, the signer on the uh, the note or the title, uh, let's talk about the straw man trust, i.e. the birth certificate. Uh, would that cause a problem for us claiming that as our title if our mother was the grantor, would she be considered the grantor of that title? Uh, yeah, she was because she's the one that signed it, but then at 18, you're supposed to take over that trust, and I believe that was really the intent. Uh, now, if your mother's still alive, you could probably get her to transfer the rights as grantor over to you. And even if she wasn't alive, I could still do it by tacit agreement, by doing a uh, process on the, on the mother if she's... Yeah, we've got some background noise. Uh. Hello? Hello? Christian, are you there? Uh, well, it's Rhonda. Can you hear me, Desert? I hear you, Rhonda, but I don't hear Christian. I must have lost Christian. No, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Well, there, there he is. Uh, so there was some background noise there, so 
Okay, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about that. So there really shouldn't, after we're 18, there shouldn't be no problem, or if your mother still is alive, would it be advisable to do that, or do we just automatically would have that right when we turned 18? Well, I would want to create some evidence that, you know, there was a transfer. Okay. And that way I could claim it on a one. That way I've got permission from the, the grantor that there was a successory trust, which is really what we're talking about uh, on the Monday calls there, which was a privity of estate. And privity of estate was, by definition, under Black's law, it was a successive trust. You know, so it's, it's succeeding along the lines. Uh Okay, so if, she, if she's still alive, which would she want to? She would want to. She would be the one that would want to claim the title, right? So she could move it to me. You could do it that way, but I would want to say, you know, have her give you the uh, the rights for it under, say, ten dollars of valuable consideration. Say, and I, I purchased the total rights to the trust. Okay. So for ten dollars and other valuable consideration, you know, I purchased all the right title and interest in that fiction birth certificate that she signed as that trust. And that would just be a private agreement between us, and then if she just, we just had a private agreement between us, uh, which we probably put, you know, an RA number on to associate it with what we're claiming. But once we had that private agreement, then I could go ahead and claim the title then. Yeah, on a one, I would claim the title and say, you know, I've, I've taken possession, that, that, uh, that trust was, um, I'm now the grantor on it. I have all the right title and interest as grantor. Okay. Okay, and, uh, earlier when you was talking about a non-negotiable instrument, because I've heard you say before that the instrument was actually a debtor-creditor language. Yeah. Is that correct? It was non-negotiable instruments, whether it be a check, a draft, a uh, money order, promissory note, uh, anything under UCC as negotiable instrument is okay. UCC, and UCC is debtor-creditor. Okay, so maybe w would it be better to cause it, call it a non-negotiable special deposit? Yeah, because I'm not treating it as, everything as non-negotiable from here on in. I'm not doing negotiable instruments any longer. I'm doing non-negotiable instruments, which are trust. Oh, just just being non-negotiable makes it a trust. Uh, yeah. Because that, 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 saying it's non-negotiable basically identifies it as a special deposit. Yeah, kind of, because it should be a special deposit as non-negotiable, but then if I keep instructions with for segregation, then that's even further proof that it's a trust. Okay, so non-negotiable, it's for this purpose and this purpose alone. Yeah, right. Not to be commingled. Right. Okay, so just by calling it a non-negotiable, basically, you're, like you said, states that it is, or is evidence of a special deposit and then further clarifying it in the language that what, what it's to be used for. Right, it could be language like, hey, I gave you my pen and I want my pen back. It's my pen. Okay. I want my pen back. Yeah, my $50 pen. Don't give me no 39 cent bick. <laughs> that 39 cent bick is not my pen. Now, I didn't really say uh, it was non commingable, but that's what I meant. I want my pen back. If I, if I give you my pen, I want my pen back. That was a special deposit. Okay, now uh, this just off the top of my head. If we uh, if we we make a special deposit, say to the treasury to pay our debts uh, and send them a non-negotiable uh, special deposit to do that, that we want we want that special deposit back. What what actually are they going to use to to pay those debts? They're, they're not going to use that instrument because we want that instrument back. Okay. Uh... Just it depends whether or not it's really supposed to be for the benefit of the third party, and a third party can be the same as the grantor. So, in effect, you would get it back. Remember those three examples I gave uh, uh, about a month ago? And I said, you know, the, pay attention to how the grantor and the trustee can be one and the same, or they right. can be a third party. The grantor can be the, uh, the beneficiary can be a third party. Yeah. That, that's how that slides back and forth on that example there. Because it was like if it was in him, within himself as grantor beneficiary, or, or excuse me, grantor trustee within himself. Okay. Okay, now I'm getting it. Because we're basically, uh, should be the beneficiaries over there on the public side, but because they construed it the way they wanted to construe it, uh, and duped us into putting ourselves down as trustee and them beneficiaries, 
once we straighten that out, we're putting it in, but it's going to come back because we're ultimately the beneficiaries. If that's how you have it set up, yes. Okay. Because definition okay. of uh, trust deposit under Black's uh, fourth revised says that uh, where money or property is deposited to be kept intact and not commingled with other funds or property of the bank and is to be returned in kind to the depositor. Now the question is, you know, who's the depositor? It could be just the grantor, but if the grantor, his intent and purpose was that the uh, who was to get the deposit back was said to be the beneficiary. So if the depositor was also the grantor slash beneficiary, so now continuing on with the definition, it says, or devoted to a particular purpose or requirement of depositor or payment of a particular debt or obligation of the depositor. So bingo. And this is also called special deposit. But this is the definition under trust deposit under Black's Law, fourth revised. So the special deposit could be used for the payment of particular debts or obligations of whoever the depositor or the grantor said it was supposed to be. Because uh, I would give it an order for a conversion of the asset to, say, cash or non-cash whatever I want to do, and pay the obligation or the debt. Okay, if, if you give an order for conversion, then then uh, you're not, would you be getting that exact same instrument back or not now because you made an order for the conversion of that instrument? Yeah, so once the funds are converted, when it comes back out, then it gets applied towards the debt or the obligation. So in effect, I got my deposit back out, but I I gave the order to convert it to say cash and take care of the debt. Okay, just in a, it turned you just turned it into a different form, so right. You got it back just in a different form. Yes, I got the special deposit back, but it went towards the application of the debt or the obligation that was owed, say by the beneficiary. Okay, okay thank you. And we, we might want to look at uh, Dominic. Oh, I'm sorry, Rhonda, were you still doing it? No, we might want to look at the. Uh, uh, bank Officers Handbook of Commercial Banking under the 6th edition, where it talks about under 19.02, Section 2C, where it talks about special deposits, where the special deposits take many forms, and it sometimes there are a means of holding funds in litigation, and it says trust funds, and cash securities of various types, and such deposits to show good faith in the case of contracts, and we know it can't be contracts because everything's got to be a trust. So in the case of contracts and the like, attorneys maintain such accounts to hold funds of clients for whom they have, are fiduciaries, and special deposits are created by special contract between the bank and the depositor. And again, there's that contract word. So in most instances of special deposits for the benefit of a third person, the bank becomes the trustee of the deposit for the benefit of the named person. Now, special deposits are often payable upon demand, sometimes upon terms, and occasionally they bear small amounts of interest. And in many instances, such accounts are evidenced by certificate of deposit. And we might want to read D, the next six section, right after that, which talks about certificates of deposit. It says, certificates of deposits, or CDs, are instruments issued by the bank specifically, or specifying that a sum, certain sum of money has been deposited. And these certificates may be either negotiable, which are public, and, or non-negotiable, which are private. So they're either negotiable or non-negotiable. So when non-negotiable, the bank simply contracts to return the amount to the depositor plus any contracted for interest. And if the certificate is negotiable, the bank agrees to pay the depositor or any person whom the depositor shall order or the bearer of the certificate. And when the CD is a negotiable CD, the debt of the bank is to the legal holder of the certificate and not to the original depositor. And then we jump ahead a couple sections uh, to number three where it says opening account. So opening account, so that would be, so say, a special deposit account. And we're going to do that by simple contract with the trust department. 
So opening an account in a bank involves only a simple contract in which the depositor lends money to the bank in return for an agreement by the bank to pay back the amount either with or without interest. With or without interest. I like mine with interest. And then skipping down into the next paragraph, it says these contracts are usually drawn so as to give the bank a maximum protection in the circumstances, but if they are unduly harsh and one-sided, or if they are unfairly uh, surprised the customers, or attempt to disclaim responsibility for acting in good faith and with reasonable care, they may not be enforceable against the customer. And then it goes into the federal law requires banks to give special notice of some bank deposit policies. And then the next section talks about, number four, unconscionable agreements, or really antitrust. So in the, or it says in about the second sentence, it's a well-known rule of law incorporated in the UCC is that between the parties, rules of law can be changed by agreement. And skipping down farther, it says that it required their customers to waive legal rights, which would be that it would be unconscionable. And down a little farther, it says when such contracts are not negotiated by the parties with equal bargaining power and understanding, and that would be a monopoly, and when they work a hardship on one of the parties, they may be found to be contracts of adhesion or unconscionable contracts. And under the UCC, courts refuse to enforce these contracts against the injured parties. And then we want to jump to UCC Article 4, Section 103. And 103 is variation by agreement, variation by agreement. And you're going to get a variation by agreement to do a special deposit. And you need to get the official comments on the UCC because the official comments under 4-103, the variation by agreement, is explained. It says the rules for the variation under Section 1 of the official comments, it says the effect of this act by agreement and the limitations to this power, in other words, the UCC, so Section 4-103 states the specific rules for variation of Article 4 by agreement. And by the way, Article 4 is bank deposits and collections. And it says by agreement and also certain standards of ordinary care. And skipping down, it would be unwise to freeze present methods of operation by mandatory statutory rules. And this section therefore permits within the wide limits, variations of the effect of the provisions of the article by agreement. Number two says that subsection A confers blanket power to vary all provisions of the article by agreement of the ordinary care. And the agreement may not disclaim a bank's responsibility for its own lack of good faith or failure to exercise ordinary care and may not limit the measure of damages for the lack of failure. Skipping down to the next paragraph. As here used agreement, as the meaning given to it by section 1-201, section 3, the agreement may be direct, as between the owner and the depository bank, or indirect, as in the case in which the owner authorizes a particular type of procedure, special deposit, and any bank in the collection chain acts pursuant to such authorization. It may be with respect to a single item or to all items. How about non-cash, non-negotiable items? Trust items handled for a particular customer. Example, a general agreement between the depository bank and the customer at the time a deposit account is opened. It says that the actions by the affected party constituting acceptance, adoption, ratification, estoppel, and the like are agreements if they meet the test of the definitions of agreement. I mean, if you go through this whole section, this is quite lengthy here. Uh, talks about good faith in section four. And it says that uh, section C further provides the absent special instructions action or non-action consistent with clearinghouse rules and the like and or with a general banking usage not disproved by the article prima facie constitutes the exercise of ordinary care. And this is in general use is 
blah, 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 and on down the or the like with the banking usage prima facie constitutes exercise of ordinary care. However, the phrase, in the absence of a special instruction, a quote, unquote, affords owners of items an opportunity to prescribe, prescribe now, prescribe, look at up in blacks, other standards, and although there may be no direct supervision or control of clearing houses or banking usage by official supervisory authorities, the confirmation of ordinary care by compliance with these standards is prima facie only, thus conferring on the courts the ultimate power to determine ordinary care in the case in which it should appear desirable to do so. The prima facie rule does not, however, impose on the party contesting the standards to establish that they are unreasonable, arbitrary, or unfair as used by the particular bank. In other words, keep in mind antitrust. You've got an unfair advantage over these people. Number five, subsection D in the line of a flexible approach required for the bank collection process is designated to make clear that a novel procedure, novel procedure, how about special deposits, be adopted by a bank is not to be considered unreasonable merely because that procedure is not specifically contemplated by this article or by agreement or because it has not yet been generally accepted as a bank usage. And remember, usage has got to do with trust. Changing conditions constantly call for new procedures, and someone has to use, use is trust, someone has to use the new procedure first. Keep in mind, special handling of non-cash items. We need the official comments on the UCC. Now, what happens if they don't take your special deposit? Well, on page three of the introductory view of the rise and progress of trust by Lewin, 1888, page three, uh, towards the end of the paragraph, it says that it's talking, gives an example uh, to illustrate the example of privity of estate, or remember estate is trust, so privity of trust, and privity means knowledge, so it's knowledge of trust. So the knowledge of a trust, illustrated example, here it goes through this quite lengthy thing of, uh, and it's a little complicated to decipher it, but anyway, he says that the, and by the same rule, neither tenant by the Kurtz courtesy or the, by the dower, nor tenant by the illegit was liable to the execution of the use for the interest where the new and original estates and could not be said to have been impressed upon the use. So here's the clincher. So the Lord, bingo, the Lord, a.k.a. bank, who was in by his cheat, he was in by an action to contract, he cheated. He was a deceiver, an abater, an intruder, and he was not amenable, not legally answerable to the subpoena for the first claim by title paramount to the creation of the use, and the use is the trust. And it says that the last three were seized of the torturous estate and held adversely to the fee to uses. So the Lord, number one, the bank, talked about in that article a little bit earlier that a corporation, say the bank, could not stand seized to a use. Well, how was it said could a corporation be capable of confidence when it is not, when it doesn't have a soul? Nor was it competent for the king or the lord to sustain the character of trustee for it was thought inconsistent with the high prerogative that he should be made responsible to his own subject for the due administration of the estate, and the estate is the trust. So a corporation cannot administer a trust. A corporation cannot be lord over anything. And a corporation or the lord cannot be in his cheat because it would violate his character, even if he was calling himself sovereign, which he is not. There is only one sovereign. It has to be living, sentient beings. They are the lords. They are the grantors. And everything is backwards in the physical realm, twisted. And only till you know and understand 
Are you going to be able to write it the right side up? So, the next question. All right, Christian, we've got one from our new listener, Dominic, in Ireland. Let me open up our Skype here. And uh says here, oh, and he has a nice, uh, let's see, nice compliment. He's, uh, by the way, he's from uh, the opposite side of the country, from Belfast, uh, which is on the far north. He lives in Kerry, far south. And uh, he knows some people up there, and he's a Christian and knows a few people up in the Belfast area. And he it was referred by Matt over in England. And he says, uh, 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 we have a, a few here in Southern Ireland that are starting to listen to the show, and your support is growing steadily over here, and it all stems from English law. Yes, and uh, Dominic's question is, forgive my lack of understanding on this, but I would like to know how one would employ a trust strategy on a mortgage that is not in arrears. What is the best way to go about it from expression to collapse if it's possible to skim through briefly. I am learning, so excuse my basic question. Love the show. Thanks, Dominic. Okay, that's that's a, a pretty technical question, really, and it can't really be explained, say, on one one show. But I did one show Tuesday here, the uh, January 26, which is I haven't put it up on the site yet. But you want to mark that one for getting a hold of that one. It's on uh, 2010, January 26. That's last Tuesday. And I went through, like, from A to Z explaining all that out. So you're basically going to do it the same way that you would even if you didn't have an action or if you had an action in a court or a foreclosure because it's basically the same thing. You're going to, you're going to claim the title. You're going to approve the trust. And then you're going to have to come in and prove the trust in a court action. So if you don't have a foreclosure, you're going to have to create an independent action and come in and present a counterclaim or a claim against it, proving the trust. But it would tr be treated the same way whether or not they bring an action against you or whether you have to bring an action against them. And it's basically going to be the same same way. You're going to come in with the, the elements, to be able to prove the elements and one of the methods of formation so that you can prove that you had standing. And you're going to come in and, and uh, treat that as a special deposit on the mortgage. And then you're either going to uh, move or merge the titles and terminate the trust and collect on the disbursement, or else you're going to make a claim against the trustee and force the trustee into doing his duty, which would be to disperse the funds. So whichever way, you know, you can go either way. The same effects are achieved, the disbursement of the funds. Now, that, that's pretty much in a nutshell of, uh, on a simplified model, but I gave all, quite a bit of detail for the first hour of that show on the 26th. I'd hate to go back through it all again. Uh, but the remedy is not in the debtor-credit relationship as secured party credit. The remedy is in trust, and it's commerce through the trust and equity. And really, we're just moving the titles in trust functioning as commerce. And your payment under special deposit is nothing more than in the Gilbert's book, uh, Section 159, which is the merging of the titles. And when you merge the titles, that is likened to a bill of exchange because you're exchanging the titles and that's basically what a bill of exchange does, exchanging one bill for another. So the move, moving of the titles and merging of the title, the order to merge is likened to a bill of exchange. It is your payment. So that, that's why I liken it. So have another question? Okay, Christian. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, from Tyra out there in uh, Florida. I have a question for Christian. The civil rules allow 10 days for an objection of a clerk sale to be filed, not served. Charlie missed the filing of the objection with the clerk by one day. An objection was denied as untimely. Is there any other way to express the trust? Uh, yeah, the, the objection really doesn't make much difference other than it was a mechanism for jamming up the court to slow it down a little bit. Uh, you'd probably have to come back in with a counterclaim, countersuit, an independent action against them then if they won't let you uh, put any more documentation in other than that. That's, uh, that's about what I could think off the top of my head right there. Okay, follow up. A new case? Question mark. Yeah, uh, if necessary, new case, yeah. Okay, any 
follow up? Okay, thank he says thank you. Okay, thank you, Tyra. Good to hear you on the program here. And uh take our next caller. Wanna welcome all of our new listeners to the Real Public Radio dot net and Kristen Walters right here on Money Banking and Trust every Saturday at seven PM Eastern time and later this evening, ladies and gentlemen, the Forbidden History series, nine thirty PM Eastern Time and just a little more than one hour, the Starfire Chronicles and, and we'll be talking about the metaphors and symbols of life and the origin of our universe, how it all began. Uh, they've, the, the story's never been told, really, okay? And so we're going to be presenting that uh, in just over an hour, okay? How it all began, not necessarily with a big bang. Uh, the truth is stranger than fiction, okay? So uh, just stand by for that broadcast. And now we're uh, going to take a call from, uh, well, we got, it looks like uh, DP in Georgia again. We'll try you again. DP in Atlanta, are you there? Yeah, hi, guys. Sorry I was at the door earlier. <laughs> That's okay. Hit star, hit, hit, not star, but just six. Number six, about three or four times. DP, okay. boost your audio, please. Can you hear me now? Uh, well, hit it a couple more times. I'm going to boost you over here. Okay, I bet you're good now. Yeah, hi, Christian. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. I'm trying to straighten out my UCC filings. Uh, I'm kind of new at this. About three months ago, I filed under in Washington online and Georgia also. And the debtor was the straw man. And then I filed at Indiana, where I was naturalized, uh, reversed as a non-UCC filing. Uh, how should I straighten this out? Uh, you mean, what was the UCC filings pertaining to the claiming of this? Uh, property belonging to the debtor belongs to the secured party. Okay, that's, you know, uh, that, that, that's... Like Tim Turner teaches. Yeah, that's under the debtor credit relationship and we're not we're not doing that any longer. Uh, uh we're treating everything. But should that terminate? Should terminate that? It, yeah. yeah. You see what we're gonna do is we, we we what we've really done is we've done everything thinking we were trying to access the private side and we really haven't. So all we've done really is we put created more debt under a lien and added that debt upon the debt, thinking that that debt was going to pay the debt. And all we did is just created more double debt. And really, they've been loving us for all that, because that debt is what is functioning as money. Uh huh. So all we, that we terminate we those just created more debt titles on the on the public side that we have to really discharge by doing. I think the trust method is going to be the way that they actually accesses the the private side, which we have never done under debt or credit, as far as I can see. So you could terminate that, but the debt still exists. The only way you're going to discharge that debt is if you combine it with an asset of an equal value on the private side. And that's what we're going to do through trust. Okay. We're going to go back and we're going to claim trust, prove trust, set up our standing, be able to close the count down, merge the titles of the debt into one entity, terminate the whole account, the whole debt titles, past, present, and future. And therefore, we've come out of bankruptcy individually. We're no longer bankrupt because now we're solvent because we're paying our debts with our assets. You know, the funny thing about insolvency is you have the assets to pay the debts, but if you don't pay the debts, even though you have the assets, you're considered to be insolvent. So we've had the ability to pay the debts all along. We've been insolvent because we chose not to pay the debts, and therefore a trust had to be formed to protect the beneficiary's assets from getting seized from the creditors now coming at them. That was the whole purpose of the formation of the trust, and a protective trust. Right. Now, once we want to make the offer by an acknowledgement of the debt, which is going to stop the prescription, and the prescription is the extinguishing of the right or the claim, which would be the expression of the trust, since we never expressed it, over a period of time, they're going to extinguish our right to do that. But if you put it in an acknowledgement of the debt first, that stops prescription. Now you've got a right to come in because you've made an acknowledgement of the debt. You're not in an argument with them. You're in agreement with them. Now there's no controversy, and now there's no purpose for the debt to be held up in trust because you're starting to act like a, the way you should be, paying your debts. And now the purpose of the trust is going to be uh, taken off because the trust is going to terminate if you fulfill the purpose of the trust, which is to protect your assets because you were bankrupt, because you didn't pay your debts. Now, pay your, make an offer to pay your debts. You'll get access to the funds, 
and then you can pay your debts. But we can't we can't get there under debt or creditor. We got to come through trust first. The remedy is not in debt or creditor, as I said earlier, as a secured party creditor. The remedy is in trust. It's in commerce through trust and equity. We're really moving. But this doesn't trust, mess up anything, up. though, right? Say again. Does the UCC filing that I've done mess up anything then? Well, it, it's created more debt that you really have to take care of, but it doesn't make any difference because I, as much debt is on the one side, I've got an equal amount on the other side to set it off on the one side and discharge it on the other. They're going to equal amount. Okay. And the remainder of the trust assets on the private side is going to be flowing into a new trust account that I'm going to establish. And the trust is going to be terminated. And then we're going to generate another LLC on a, on a public side, which is the interest is going to be generated and put into that. And I'm going to write checks against any consumables for the real man with goods and services that are going to be used to sustain the real man in the private from the public side. Uh -huh. And nobody's going to be the wiser. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, we've got Ed out of Washington. You guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hit you six a few times. Yeah, this is Ed in Virginia. How are you guys tonight? Ed, I have uh, your have... audio, please. You're low on our end, Ed, please. I'm low? Okay. Yeah. yeah. How are we doing now? A little more, please. At six times. Okay. Uh, one, a couple more times, Ed. All right, you're good. A little better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, and thank you for taking my call. I, I didn't know if you'd forgotten me or if I'd never made it in the queue or not, but here we are. Um... I appreciate what you guys are doing. It's uh, it, it seems again from my bird's eye view, my limited knowledge. Just correct me if my thinking's wrong here. While it may take some adjustment to your thinking and and another reversal of an, yet another lobotomy to, uh, y you know, to, to come into a realization of what Christian is teaching, it seems in essence once you understand, much simpler a much simpler simpler way to operate in commerce. Right. Am I thinking correctly? Right. Okay. Oh, a lot right. simpler. Yeah, because I, I'm, I'm. Th now there seems to be so many pieces of that spider web that have us entangled. Yeah, and by the time you the figure UCC out rules that you got in that whole book, you know, and the 63 million right. uh, statutes and codes, you know. Right. It's a world of shifting sands. Yeah, yeah. It's all under debt. Can't, or, oh, okay. Yeah, and, and I just, you know, I, I recently, just in December, came back from from uh, a seminar with Tim, Tim Turner. And I, I just, I, I was still scratching my head saying that something's still bugging me about all this. I, I don't know what it is, but I know that something's still bugging me. And it, it just seems so much to keep up with all the time. And that's a full-time job in and of itself. While, uh, what, what, it, 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 am I correct in saying, I've got the Gilbert's Law Summary, like, uh, ordered it as soon as I was on one of your first calls, Christian, back, uh, well, uh, first I heard one of your first calls back in, uh, Late December or so, I got Gilbert's Law summaries and Black's Law is coming. Great. So I'm uh, following orders here. To but it is you, the basic trust law, 40 pages, or different in each state? Or am, am I thinking correctly here? Well, uh, basic trust law is 40 pages, you think? I read. Okay, listen, I read that somewhere, and and forgive me if it sounds like a dumb question, but I'm just asking. I'd rather ask a dumb question than be. Yeah, if you would go uh, to, say, the uh, the Hague Convention, they have a set of rules up there. I forget the title of it. I have to pull it out. But uh, the, the restatement, uh, similar to law and trust up there. And it's, it's, it's very, uh, very simple. It's probably less than, less than 40 pages. Okay. Your UTC, okay. Uniform so. Trust Code, which is in, a, in every state, really, is, is a uniform model for trust law. And... That that's pretty simple. Also, you can get that off the internet. Also, so yeah, right. you're, you're you're going in the right direction. It's it's a whole lot simpler. It, forty pages is you know, it doesn't take forty pages to get the gist of it. Okay, well, I, yeah. Again, with the, the debtor creditor, I, I'm always feeling like just a body in a tsunami, constantly getting turned around because you can't keep up with it. Now, I, I have to ask this question. When a court case is filed against you or somebody's coming after you for a debt, a collection agency or uh, a divorce case, I mean, i got so many people asking me questions, I don't know why they think I know anything, but they do for some reason. 
and you know mortgage you know the whole bit people losing their homes the whole bit and i'm doing the best i can to explain what's going on under the surface what what the feet are paddling the duck but i know i don't have a complete uh a grasp on it so that's where i stop and i say hey do your homework for yourself i can only take you so far here so court cases um you know, again, uh, you got a, a lawsuit on your front door. What is going on there? What kind of trust is established? Whether it's a, a you know a, a, a wife files for divorce, a a collection agency, or somebody comes in and saying, hey, we're gonna we're trying to get a default judgment against you. What's going on there? It's an offer for formation of a trust that if you don't express it being a trust, then they're going to construe it under debtor credit and they're going to foreclose on you as a debtor. That's as simple as it is. The fact okay, that you don't so express that, it via trust is going to allow it to be construed under debtor credit or under UCC, subject to negotiable instrument law, which is statutes and codes. And they've got you construed to be the trustee under a trust, but you never knew it. And they're going to make you the debtor to pay under Federal Reserve notes. And here all along, your, your instrument could have been used as a, your, their offer could have been used as a special deposit. And the title and moving the title and merging the title, which would become similar to a check or a bill of exchange under debtor creditor, but it's, I liken it to that, but it's not. It's trust because it's the order to move the titles and merge the title that is the order for the settlement. That is the payment. Okay, and here's another question. I have some personal issues that are very pressing. I need to put them to rest. Where can I get some guidance? Uh, really, the workshops. Study. When we start the workshops, okay. That's where that's where we're going to get down into some paperwork. Some some functional, practical remedy. Yeah, that's where we're going to apply it. Always okay. been leading up to that. Okay. Okay. So I I've got a court case in May uh, with one one of the above. And I, I just like to bury this thing long before that and say, no, thank you. I don't participate in this fashion. And I, and I really want to put it to rest because it's keeping me up at night and, you know, it's hurting, and, and, and it's really hurting my children. Okay. It's really hurting my children. This lawyer's. Well, it really comes back to, you know, knowing the formation of the trust, how to, you know, the four elements and one of the methods of formation of trust in order to prove the trust and creating the evidence to prove that trust of that. Knowing how okay. to get it into the court, then. So, okay, that all right. I, I, I'll leave that at, at that for now. And uh, when you when you mentioned the uh, the straw man earlier, I, I didn't quite grasp all that you were implying or or trying to say there. When you, it was one of the first questions tonight uh, in reference to the straw man. Could you give me a little more clue? Because I forget what the first question was. Uh, well, let's say, how does new trust technology affect the existence of the straw man? Are you keeping him alive? Are you trying to kill it or or tap into it? I, I, I'm not really sure how it... Well, I, I am personally planning on totally terminating the account and forming all the uh, uh, the assets in it into another trust. Okay. So, so would you still have access to those to those funds? Oh, yeah. Are available to us? I have total access to those funds then. Okay. So things like the OID process would become unnecessary. Correct, because you're uh, generating interest that's recognizable on this new LLC, a separate entity that you're creating that's going to be crossing over from one side to the other side, so to speak. And you'll be writing checks, okay. like out of a checking account, w which your interest is generated on the, uh, the source of it is going to be on the private side, which is not taxable. And it's really not affected, effectively connected with a business or trade in the United States. But all of it looks the same as just like you would write a check today, because that's really what you're doing. Because the interest is going to be functional credit that is being used as money in this public realm. It's going to match right in. It's the same thing. Nobody's going to be the wiser. When you say that, what do you mean? Nobody's going to be the wiser. The people that are trying to, to, to trap us. Yes, because when somebody wants a payment, I will be able to pay them from as much interest as I need, because I can create it as much interest that I want based on my private source assets. And your private source assets are originated where? Uh, it's what's originally held in trust right now, waiting for us. Okay. Technically, the straw man account. Okay. See, what I'm doing is Here's merging the total assets, debts on the public side of all my debts, past, present, and future. And that is a capital T standing for titles, 
and a, a subheading right at the foot of that is a D, and the D stands for debt. So it's a it's debt titles. So all the debt titles on the private side that are under that account, that straw man account, I'm going to put it all in as one title. And whatever that value is that they say it is, then I'm going to take on the other side, on the private side, a corresponding title, a T, with an A now as a footnote, foot sub. The A stands for assets, so it's a title to the assets. I'm going to merge those both those titles into that straw man account, and when the assets meet the debts, then they plus and minus, you know, cancel each other out. But one penny of real lawful money obliterates, I don't care how much debt you got. So the remainder is going to be all the assets left that's in there, say minus one penny. And then I'm going to form that, since it's been that master count has been, that uh, straw man has been liquidated, he's been terminated, I'm going to form another account on the private, and the remainder is going to be flowing into that account, put into that account. And that's the private source. It never leaves there because you can't. When do you plan on keeping with you? I'm sorry. Ben. You can't bring it in the public with you. It's got to remain on the private, or else you'll be commingling and and you'll be breaching. So I'm going to generate interest from that private source. It's going to be generated on the public side in another LLC, a new LLC on that side, which is going to function as my straw man. And that's going to be totally different because that straw man does not exist anymore, and all the accounts associated with it are eliminated also because they're paid. The debt is paid. It's, it's gone. It's discharged on one side and set off on the other. The accounts are brought to zero. Now so I, how does that affect the full funds held in the assets on a private? So how does that affect any jurisdiction, any, any court uh, or uh, uh, tries to impose upon you? I'm not under any jurisdiction or statutes and codes under the U.S. fiction realm. I'm in America. Okay. So the secured party status is... Then I get a special passport that allows me to pass through their realm whenever I want to. Are you saying pass for metaphorically or actually? No, an actual passport by an executor, right. an informal executor, right. instead of a formal executor. And an executor is a recognition of uh, an ambassador by a foreign entity. So they recognize me basically as being a diplomat, a non-resident alien with special diplomatic immunities and a special passport that do doesn't have the same number as that straw man because that straw man account, he's, it's been terminated. And when they punch that number up, oh, number comes up, do not detain. As long as you... So you have the diplomatic immunity. Yes. And if somebody tries to sue the capital, all capital letter, Christian Walters, they go, you're wasting your time. It doesn't exist anymore. That account's terminated. That was a trust account. It's terminated and all the associated accounts with it. All those years of lifetime, that everything that was formed against that straw man account is terminated. The debt's been paid. The account's zeroed. So any, any that, that includes, all-inclusive, any court cases? Yes. Uh, all debt titles. Past, present, and future. Capital letters on it. Yep. Sounds like an act that was... Uh, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah, after redemption. All right. On a cross. Uh, when, when are you going to kick this off? Well, I have basically been kicking off. I really explained it pretty much in depth on last Tuesday's show on, the, on 126 of this year, 2010. Well, when's that going to be posted? Because I was interested in listening to that, because especially on the mortgage side when this gentleman asked that from, yeah. uh, from Ireland. Yeah, I've been kind of holding it back because I've been trying to get it up on the website. On your website? Yeah, on, on movingtitles.com, yes. Okay, all right. All right, I don't want to monopolize. I, I appreciate it, but, you know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask a question in the simplest fashion because I, I guarantee if I have that question on my in my mind, a hundred other people sure. also have the same question. Absolutely. So, I, I appreciate your patience. No problem. And I appreciate the question. I'll let, yeah, I'll let, I'll let someone else ask. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Hit, hit Thank you, Ed. one. Yes, sir. Star Thank one will you. meet you out. Okay. Okay, Ed. Come on back. Okay, we got JC in Arizona. JC, good to have you on the program. Thank you, Desert. Thank you, Christian. Hi, JC. So a couple of us were talking about the, uh, the methods of formation, the, the declaration being one of them specifically, and we're going back to the Declaration of Independence 
and Rhonda, if you're out there, if you want to chime in after this, uh, I welcome your, your input on this because you and I talked about this specifically. So on the Declaration of Independence, we're talking about the parties and the creation of the Allonge. And when we're coming in and uh, signing our name and putting our name onto that document, to us or to me, it seemed that the Declaration of Independence, the parties therein, the signers to that were coming in as grantors, but we can also view them as the trustees on that, the public trust of the uh, body politic. So that's why they did the declaration, because the grantor trustees were the same parties. Does that make sense? Okay, if the grantor trustee were the same parties as on the Declaration of Independence, is that what you're saying? Right. Uh, that's when you use the declaration, when the parties are the trust or grantors, when they're the same party, correct? It kind of lose me there. I'm not quite. Let me back up a little bit. The reason the reason why this uh, the reason why this came up is because we're looking at on page three privy of a state privy of contract, and uh, when we look at who was holding the assets in as trustees from the very beginning up until right now, the the uh, uh, the trustee of the bankruptcy currently then there's privity that goes all the way back from each party, all the way back to the beginning of the formation of the initial trust. So we were just talking about who are the parties involved, and it made sense to me that the signers, the, through declaration, were both grant and trustee on that. Yeah, I think we are, we are not taking into consideration the flip-flop in 33, because as trustee starting out pre-33, you would be beneficiary post-33. That, okay, so that the, the 33 event just flip flopped that in the public. Yeah, uh, and that way it looks similar, but it's not. It's it's been flipped. So the only reason we're then uh, taking the Declaration of Independence and putting our signature as uh, as a grant or to that as well is so that it becomes our law form. Yeah, Declaration of Law Form, Declaration of Status, and I'm putting that back in the private deposit under Special Deposit on the private side again on that new account that we're going to be forming. Okay. My second question was when you are, if you want to be proactive, you can always wait for the charging instrument to come to you, and you can uh, set up the trust, express the trust, move titles, and shut down the account that way. That's one way. Um, and you do that, uh, or you can do that by coming in via counterclaim uh, when you make that special trust deposit. If you want to be proactive and you want to go after one of your, uh, as a gentleman, as Ed said before, either um, a creditor coming after you or someone suing you or your ex-wife or whatever that's going to be, or uh, and a government agency like the IRS. I know there's a lot of people out there who have issues with them. Uh, if you want to be proactive about this, specifically a government agency, you can't just sue them because you have to go through the DOJ. And I believe Liar Liar has a question. So Liar Liar, since you're on my line, you, you'll uh, if you want to just unmute when I'm done, you can ask your question. By the way, um, when when uh, Liar Liar actually had said that we need to ask permission of the DOJ to sue the IRS, are you familiar with that? If we wanted to be proactive and and bring our summons, and yeah. They're, they're always giving us to ask the question to them, you know, and whoever's asking the question is king, because asking is king, you know. So anybody who participates in commerce under UCC, their sovereignty is re reduced down to zero. They got no sovereignty. Erie versus Tompkins, Clearfield Doctrines, 1938, well-established case there, that anybody who participates in commerce has no sovereignty. I don't need to ask them for permission. I'm going to come at them under trust. And I'm not going to really, ultimately, I'm going to come at them under the Treasury Dib hearing, 25-06. And I could bypass court altogether. So I'm keeping it strictly administrative. So maybe the answer is not being proactive in a U.S. District Court, but rather being proactive by sending them a special deposit and then, and then um, asking for, uh, or rather demanding, uh, did hearing. Yes. And keeping it administrative that way. Yes. Okay. Well, that makes sense, too. That that makes actually a lot of sense. Is it more so private? It might, it can be mm -hmm. Taking the agreement of the parties to them proactively, to me, just makes a lot of sense, rather than waiting for some big charging instrument to come your way and then work on the backside. 
I agree with you, yeah. If you especially if you know it's coming up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Liar liar. Well also keep it in mind in my opinion, uh when it when when that charging instrument comes after you uh for right now until we can fully establish what we need to establish, that charging instrument is yours. They need your energy. So the so the acceptance uh, in my opinion, on a UCC-1, once again, you can do it on either side, non-UCC filing or normal filing, now makes everything in that belongs to you as a quote-unquote dirty word I keep hearing people say, secure party creditor. Now you need to do what needs to be necessary by way of another negotiable instrument. In this case, you have accepted their charging instrument. You reduce it back to a bill of exchange then you're out of the umbrella of dealing in commerce because you've accepted their negotiable instrument and now you returned it back to them through offset. But that's just my opinion. But one of the comments I wanted to make was a gentleman earlier uh, with regards to the employer or, you know, i.e. I. not paying your fair share. And until Christian uh, puts that out there for further development, you know, his, his method on that, the only thing I wanted to say was that you can always fill out another W-4 claiming the tax-exempt status. And what you would need to do with that, you got one or two ways to now file uh, to recoup your, your funding. You can use a 1041, put the straw party's name with TTE behind it, which means, means it's a trust entity, uh, file your taxes that way through through the business side, claiming everything that you did during that year. And, and this is, in my opinion, that is the only proper way to do the OID process. But without using the OID process, uh, you know, it's, it's basically as business. You're keeping all of your receipts. If you don't have your receipts, your bank account acts as your ledger because through your bank account, you know what entities you pay what, when, how, and where. So that's another uh, bookkeeping entry, so to speak, when you, when you don't necessarily have your receipts. You can also do that on the 1040, by the way. It's called itemization. You know, every, everybody fails to read those 1040 or 1040 booklets to show you what you need to do. They, the, the IMF is no more than, uh, or, or the IRS is no more than a reporting agency. They need you to help them report the accuracy of the records. That's all they want you to do. Uh, with regard to the court case or any court case that one wishes to use as precedence in your upcoming case, you have to secure a certified copy of that court case and then put it into your court, uh, court case, certifying it in and then certifying it back out. Because everything you put in a court case is no more than what they call exhibits. Now you need to take either a letter of toy or a writ of uh, precipice. Well, not a writ of precipice, but a precipice to the clerk of the court to have her take each and every uh, filing that you do both front and back and enter it into the evidence file and in big red bold letters on that letter rogatory or the precipice, not for public viewing. Now you sealed everything in the, in the private. Okay, uh, and that was all I wanted to add to that. All right. Uh, a, a lot of that is still, I think, coming back from a debtor-creditor point of view, and I would not do any uh, bills of exchanges or money orders or promissory notes or any kind of uh, negotiable debt instruments uh, because everything I'm going to do is going to be likened to that, although it's going to be done strictly through trust. And uh, as I said earlier, my bill of exchange, likening it to a bill of exchange is really section 159 where I'm merging the titles. And that merging of the titles, that becomes the payment instrument. I'm not using any bills of exchange at all. And uh, completely getting away with the, a debtor crediting uh, mentality is, is, is hard to do uh, to get that unwound because that terminology is so ingrained in our minds and we're so accustomed to using it under the UCC and things that it's, it's, uh, it's actually the stumbling block that, you know, that's one of the main reasons why we can't see trust so much because we've been so 
accustomed to using debtor creditor and UCC and things and, because that's how they're using the function as commerce, but that is the misconstruement of trust. And it's really, yeah, you got to have a, a paradigm shift in an attitude of thinking and we, we can't sit, talk about contracts any longer because contracts are really trust and we can't talk about debtor creditor instruments anymore, negotiable debt instruments because that's all not trust. You know, so we got to be thinking, how is that likened to in trust? And you know, it's like except for value, where I found except for value was under trust was under that uh, page 127 in the Gilbert's book, which was, you know, just uh, transferring the assignment of the beneficiary's right after the attachment, which is exactly what an except for value return for value does. So there are there are similar things under trust devices that achieve the same thing that debtor creditor was achieving, but yet it's not debtor creditor. We don't use those terms. We use strictly trust terms, and not to be confused with the old way of thinking, because we really have to get rid of that old way of thinking, because now we got to come in and express it as a trust. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and I mean I I, I I agree with you on that, but I still for right now. Uh, you know, a lot of us, even myself, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get the technology uh, of the NTT under and under our belts wholeheartedly. Yeah. But like the one gentleman said, a lot of a lot of us uh, are under fire. I know. And for right now, we're looking for a way to either stalemate what's coming at us, or uh, basically bring some type of checkmate until we can get the actual checkmate. Of, of the trust, you know, totally under our belts. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the most service fans, and am I, you know, reducing or trying to reduce any, anything that you're trying to do? I agree with it wholeheartedly. As I expressed to you once before, a couple of months back, when I finally got on one of your calls. Uh, but like I said, you know, until a certain time, is, you know, uh, we can become proficient where. Not only we uh, are talking the talk, but now we can walk the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, unless we and 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm authority at you now. Unless everyone, uh, by way of donations, uh, start bombarding you with with taking care of our, our, our uh, problems for us <laughs> in the meantime. Yeah, but that's that's something you got to live with, I guess. That I live with so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but on, on page 41 of Gilbert's, that was all I had. There, there was the merger of the title, which is section 159. It says the merger of the title where the sole trustee is also the sole beneficiary. And that that, that really is, uh, maybe I'll do a show once on, on, you know, how to supplement the debtor-creditor devices that we've been using and how to liken it, uh, what do we use under trust. That accomplishes the same effect, and maybe I'll maybe work on that a little more. Maybe point out some examples of how that correlates back and forth. And in fact, uh, you know, we had a kind of a win that some good news, which I was saying earlier that really haven't announced yet because I really wanted to analyze what was been done, and uh, we actually had a case win that was very interesting. What the the parties had said as to the, the person purchased the the property, but yet there was no debtor creditor instrument in there to purchase it with, because it was really done through title merging, and the title merging was the payment. So uh, we're analyzing what will actually happen. Went down there, and, and when I get it all put together, then I'll be making a formal announcement on that. But anyway, maybe I'll put a show together, you know, that likens it to. You know, so so people can say, okay, when I go to say BOE, here's what I really mean under trust, and we should be, you know, talking about one sex uh, section 159, how it applies, or or the uh, section on page 127, 440, 442, as like to the accept for value, return for value, because I think people need to know where are these devices in equal force like we've been doing under debt or credit where they exist in trust so we can learn how to apply them because they're like sub tools in the toolbox of trusts and and how to get that 900 pound gorilla to be the 900 pound gorilla by operating in equity so any anyway 
Uh, is another question, Desert? Yeah, we do. Let's uh, go down here and, well, it looks like we've got Rhonda in Missouri again. Rhonda? Hi. Hi, Rhonda. And by the way, Rhonda, hold on. Hold, hold your thought. I just want to mention, uh, coming up at the bottom of the hour, ladies and gentlemen, we do have the Forbidden History series and the Starfire Chronicles, Chronicles where we'll be uh, doing a special presentation on the uh, creation of the universe, how it all began. Was it a Big Bang or was it something else? Um, I'll be interviewed uh, by, Chris, by uh, Frederick Earle, my radio host friend from Public Radio out in California. And so we'll be uh, doing a, an entire series every week on the Starfire Chronicles. We'll be talking about the words and creation that are used, the metaphors, and uh, you know, defining defining every aspect and how it all came together. Okay, so that's uh, in 30 minutes. So uh, you're welcome to stick on if you are uh, a, a listener of Christian Walters Money Banking and Trust. If you have friends that are into uh, the, um, the the scriptures and the uh, ancient history and words, well, it's all right here. Okay, what they did want you to know. So uh, thanks uh, for tuning in, and don't forget, Christian is here every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on the Real Public Radio .net. And want to welcome again all of our international listeners and all of our new listeners across North America. Rhonda, thanks. No problem. Hi, Rhonda. Uh, hi, Christian. Uh, wouldn't really the uh, pe people's checkmate be at this point until we get everything, uh, other things done? Would be to claim the trust res be a good trustee and claim the trust res and move it back to them, make the payment? Yeah, I would start, you know, if you're really jammed up on a, a nail and you got to have something done, yeah, I would still try to maybe do it under trust. Uh, if you felt comfortable that you knew it enough, you know, if not, yeah, go back to the debtor-creditor thing, give that a try because actually uh, I don't really care what method you really use. You're probably going to have the same amount of success. It's less than 10% no matter what you try. I mean, I've studied all methodology, and I can't see any rhyme or reason about anybody getting any uh, consistent success, period. That's what really made me look in another direction, because I said, man, we've got to be missing something here. I don't care what, what you do. You, 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 you have a, uh, a success rate as well as anybody else by throwing a garbage lid in there, and you'll probably just do as good. So actually treating the... the the bill or the trust property that they send you by claiming it and, and moving it back to them, you, you don't see that have, has, having any more success than, an, than the debtor-creditor side accepted for value? Well, off to the, the start, from the beginning until they're going to look at it and say, hey, this is new, something we haven't went, uh, come across, I think you probably have a higher success rate to start out with. But then once they start figuring out, well, hey, you know, we're, they're still under debt or creditor yet, and we still have discretion, and I think they'll start shutting it down again. But if we come back in and around and we pull the whole thing out, collapse it all down from the dominoes start, then I think that's going to make the whole big difference. That's going to be the, the difference between white and black, no middle ground. It's either going to be one or the other. Either okay. limited success uh, they give you, which is less than 10%, or take the whole thing down and now you got the 100% success and they make sure it all stays quiet. Okay. Now when you was talking about the, because uh, we've talked before about, for instance, using the bin forms or what we would want to do because we really don't want to use their forms to draw us back into their system. Right. The modified their form. Public documents. The substitute form. Right. So, that's, so we could do a, 25, a substitute 2506 actually. It's not going to be on their form. Uh, 2506, that's, which one is that now? That's the one for the dip hearing you said? Oh, 25-06, okay, the, uh... 25-06, my yeah, mistake. That's not, a, that's really not a form, that's just a directive that I'm going to claim on a, on a letter rogatory. I'm going to, I'm going to order a dip hearing from that directive. Oh, okay. Okay, now, back to, uh, wait a second, I'm writing this down. Uh... Back to what J.C. was asking, back to the declaration. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I see it says uh, we was, the, the declaration was establishing the, the grantors and the beneficiaries. Who was, who was the trustees on that? Okay, I like it as God when he granted to Adam the earth, say, and the universe. But it was for God's benefit. So God was the grantor and the beneficiary, and Adam was the trustee. Okay. And I look at it as being the same way as that Declaration of Independence. I believe that we are the trustees on that, and God granted us those unalienable rights to be used by us for his benefit. 
And we were supposed to glorify God by mimicking what he gave us in his character and likeness. But we, we've fallen down on that. So, And then 1933 came along, and the flip-flop, so if we were trustees, now we're, we're beneficiaries. You know, in the, in, the, in the public, we're trustees, ain't we? Uh, yeah, on the, on the trustees, yeah. So if we was trustees in the private and we're trustees in the public... Uh, it's like out of that one realm to start out with, there was two realms formed, uh, private and public. And the, or the uh, public, uh, public, private and public. But the republic was held in trust. It's hidden. So we got on the one side where they want us to see on, a, on the public side to be trustees and on our side, on the private, we want to be beneficiaries. Uh, yeah, we okay, so if on the Declaration of Independence, we, we was, the, the, the signers was declaring that the, the creator was the grantor and the beneficiary, and we was the trustees. So really, when we went over into the public, we didn't change positions because we're still trustees in the public. It's just that they claim themselves to be lord and beneficiary. Yeah, they're construing it that way, yeah, but only because we haven't expressed it. Because if we expressed it, so our, it down, then it would come back to the beginning our, again the way it was. So our position really didn't change. No, not really. No, That's right. our point of view. But a, from their point of view, yeah, it did. It, yeah. It's just so no, tip, from their point, point of view, our position didn't, their position changed. Because they took our creator out and put themselves instead. Yes, right. Yes, they, they they construe themselves to be the lords, and they're not the lords. Number one, they're corporations. They can't be the lords. They got it all backwards. But it, it's all backwards because we didn't know or understand because we didn't expect it, ex express it to be the other way. But we can always come back and re-express it, correct it back, and we can pr come up with the proof. I mean, who's the signers on this? Who was it granted to? What was the purpose? You know, and really that straw man over there, you know, it it's not that we got a uh, killing because he's already dead. I, I, we got to just give him a burial. Yeah, he's not a live entity. He's a trust account. Yeah, he, he, you know, he's not, he's not alive. You got something's got to be alive before you can kill it. You know, we just got to. He does rest. Oh, he's not alive, right? Yeah, just okay, like thank you. In that section that that's on that third page there, that the Lord, he was not not able to, even if he was a, a, a sentient being, because if he was Lord, he didn't have the right to have the character to be over his subjects. Because he was claiming to be the first title, to be paramount to the creation of the uses of the trust. By his cheek. Yeah, but he was claiming first title over the creation of the uh, trust. That's pretty nervy. He's saying, well, it should all come back to me. Well, no, it shouldn't come back to you. Number one, you're, you're Lord. You can't have it over the subjects and taking it because you're a deceased or you're a beta, you're an intruder. And now you're saying that you're not alienable to the subpoena because you're the Lord? Well, no, I'm afraid commerce has reduced you down to no lordship, no status of anything, especially because you're a fiction, because you don't even have a soul. No soul, no confidence. So you can't even claim by uh, right of title paramount to the trust. <laughs> only only a real live person can. That that section was very interesting. I wanted to come back to that next Monday. Yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty interesting. Now, when, uh, okay, that's all I got. I'll let somebody else try, uh, just take a shot at you. <laughs> I just want to let you know too. I I don't want. I like. I don't. Uh, snakes don't bother me. When we talk about chopping the head off a snake, I don't mind if snakes exist, just so they don't exist in my yard. Okay, right, yeah. Around, around my family. Yeah. Then, then in the next section, the privy as regards to the accessory key use that uh, at the bottom that says, and for the like reason, a use was not a s assets, was not subject to forfeiture, and our failure of heirs in the inheritable line did not as cheat to the Lord. So check out that uh, next paragraph in the privity as regards to city key uses, the very last sentence. Okay. Okay, thank you, Christian. You have a good evening. Okay, we got another one, Desert? All right, let's uh, check it out. Yeah, we do. We've got uh, Carlos in California. Hi, Christian. This is Carlos oh. again. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yes, and the, uh, you mentioned one of the biggest bingos that we have is the Spend Thrift Trust, right? Yep, yep. Okay, we were talking about that. Not, it only not only pertains to limiting the expenditure on a on a on a beneficiary. For, for instance, a kid who who um, takes a, a benefit of a uh, um, hundred million dollars and goes out and spends it in drugs or something like that. It, it is pertains to something else, right? Can you explain that? Well, let's just say that somebody who is really in dire need because of some medical disability and they apply for Social Security benefits and they never get it. Why is that? Well, it's because for the discretion of the bankruptcy of the trustee. He can withhold that benefit even to that person that really needs it. And I've seen some people out there that really could use it, but yet it's being withheld. Right. What is the major benefit? What is the biggest bingo of a spendish trust, in your opinion? Well, I think the fact that uh, it goes from spendthrift trust to protective trust, uh, say like around the Civil War, and then in '33 it became, you know, the discretionary trust. I think that fact there points out exactly what they're doing. That is the model, and here it has been all trust, and why we, why we never had a successful rate of the remedy. Right. And it, we can also use it as a protective trust, or does it connect to a protective trust? Well, the protective trust really was the, because uh, the, it says the rationale of the protective trust was that it's a, it's a better way under a more modern view, they said, but really it was a, a, a construment, because uh, on page 440 it says the rationale, or excuse me, 140, uh, the rationale under that section uh, 498 said that a protective trust may be intended to reach a result somewhat comparable to and in fact more secure than, so that's the way they're looking at it, more secure than the result of the spendthrift trust. But it is logically less objectionable. So that's the public more modern view. They're saying, okay, this way is less objectionable. In other words, they didn't agree with the founding fathers. And they decided since nobody said anything, we're going to change it. Because you dumb people don't know what to trust. So that gives us the right to come up and misconstrue it any way we like. And we're going to construe it this way because we like this one better. Less objectionable in that the beneficiary can be sure of receiving substantial trust benefits only as long as he keeps his debts paid. But now you guys are bankrupt. So now we don't have to pay. And through the prescription, if we wait long enough, we can abscound with all the funds from it, and we don't have to grant them any trust rights at all. And we can get away with the whole ball of wax. Not on my watch any longer, because the cat's out of the bag. And, buddy, I'm darn mad about it, because you guys yeah. didn't tell us what was really going on, which it was your right to be your brother's keeper, and you let us be a bunch of dumb incompetents by teaching us a bunch of this crap. Yeah, that cat is not going back in the bag, is it? No. That red light's been passed, and that bell's already been rung, and we're not going back. Right. Can we use that spendthrift trust as a uh, asset protection trust? I had it can uh, be reversed. Yes, because I can say, well, can be I'll agree with you. I'm trustee. I'll agree with you. I didn't make the payment. Now let's go into the chambers. Let me explain to you why I legally had the right to withhold. Of course, That's what I meant. Trust. Under discretion. Right, right. Okay, great, great. Yeah, because we we had a, a small discussion the other day about it, and I and I knew it had something else to do in, in other than just a spend thrift trust. Thank you, Christian. Uh, yeah, actually, the spend thrift trust is really a statutory, which is not the same as the Declaration of Independence because the Declaration of Independence is a private trust, you know, but it's like, likened to the spend thrift trust, and then it carries forward forward in the the protective trust and, and the discretionary trust and how they're doing it to us on this public side under the constraint. Yeah, but yes, it is a, in one of our best friends, right? Yeah, but, you know, I, I, uh, first I got to point the finger at myself because I'm the one that should have expressed the trust first. I, I fell down. I, I agree. I'm the one at fault because the fault, you know, doesn't go any farther than the first problem, and I'm the first problem. Okay. Once we correct that, yeah, now we got a different story then. Once we correct that, and I recognize that, hey, now I've expressed the trust, and the ball's back in your court now. 
What are you guys going to do? All right, all right. Are you going to fall down on what you need to do? Because now you need to give us the funds so we can make the payments. Okay. Got it. Thank you, Christian. Let someone else do Okay, Carlos, thank you. And if uh, anybody has a comment or a question, they have to hit star five. That will raise your hand. And by the way, we have a chat line. If anybody out there wants to uh, uh, talk to the other friends out there, you can talk around the world, actually, on our chat room with our friends in England or Ireland if uh, they want to. Uh, join you on the chat room, they can do that. Um, and it's a way you can exchange information. Also, if somebody wants to exchange information with somebody on this uh, call, uh, and of course, you know, we, we're not going to interrupt the call to give out information unless Christian feels the need to do that. You can all say, hey, you know, meet Bubba, meet me over on uh, the chat room, and we can exchange information. That's a way you can connect because we, uh, every, we have a lot of people of like minds here, and it's a, it's a wonderful family of uh, people coming on here, very, uh, 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 caring people, people dedicated to uh, 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 finding, it, making it a better world, and, and coming out of a lot of harsh um, uh, struggle, and uh, and a lot of uh, wonderful, uh, God-fearing uh, people who love, uh, you know, life. So we're we're very uh, honored to have all of you here, and there's a way you can all meet each other on the chat room. So uh, take advantage of it. What they do on a lot of our other programs, and uh, and we've got time just for about uh, one more question, probably, and so we'll go to. Um, Let's see, we've got, it uh, looks like a new uh, caller here, and uh, it's area code 408. Please state your first name, where are you calling from? 408, area code? Okay, um, I guess nobody's there, so they probably raised their hand by accident. Going once, going twice, area code 408. Okay, we're going to mute you back out, and we've got, uh, looks like we've got uh, John uh, or Jeannie. Uh, where are you located, John or Jeannie, 503 area code? Hello, hi, this is John, can you hear me? Yeah, John, where are you calling from? Calling from New Hampshire. Good to have you. Christian and uh, Desert, I appreciate your work very much. have a few questions. I've been uh, trying to develop a, a contract with the CFO um, regarding the uh, mortgage. Uh, the CFO is the trustee. Um, trying to uh, – we sent uh, three letters. Um, the first one stated – uh, that the note was paid at or before closing and that I'm the grantor and uh, they didn't respond but we only gave them 10 days on the first letter which is not being sent through a notary it's a private process do you think the 10 days is an impediment to that establishing a contract uh, well instead of contracts uh, as soon as you come to that word I would substitute contract and say trust and then I would start thinking trust you know, uh, are you forming it into a trust? Do, do you have the, the four elements necessary, the intent, purpose, the parties, and specific trust res? And then do I have one of the methods of formation, a declaration or, or a transfer? And do I have a record of that? Because if I claim as a trust, then i got to prove it. So unless you're using that as a debt validation, say, under a 9-210A4, you know, you... You need to be thinking more along the trust lines. Well, we started that back in uh, December, which is about the time you launched your NTT. So uh, at first I saw it as a way to get into a uh, DIB hearing in front of the CFO to present uh, an AFV payment or uh, something along those lines. And um, then uh, when... Uh, the are you in a court case already? No. no. Uh, they... They said they were going to close, foreclose back in June. Uh, we sent the debt validation letter. They put it off, and uh, back in October, they set a date, uh, which is coming up very, very shortly. Okay, just like JC said on the call earlier, he said, uh, if I had time, what I'd be doing is I would be preparing the evidence necessary for the proving of the trust, and that's what you need to be doing, because if they're going to take you into court, you've got to have that evidence ready. We are doing that. We filed a notice of interest this week. Okay, so they. Uh, the, all right, so you're getting the uh, evidence ready to, pr to prove the trust. So, uh, yes, yes. What's your method of formation? Um, the uh, ex you mean uh, it'll be an express trust um, by declaration, um, presumably, as opposed to uh, writing. You mean or transfer or? Yeah. Also, what's your specific trust res? Um, the contract that we are. Um, claiming we have with the CFO is one of them that's been uh, 
what, what is the wording or the title of that contract? Uh, really, there is no wording to the title of the contract. Then it's you have no our, trust no register. Pardon? Then, then you have no specific trust res. Without specific trust res, you don't have a trust. What about the uh, registered mail number? But the registered mail number just points to a registration in the public that points to an actual document that exists, which is going to be some kind of trust material, some kind of uh, trust res or trust indenture or something, or a record of formation. Uh, isn't the contract um, qualified as trust res? Uh, yeah, but what contract? Well, assuming that our process isn't flawed, um, the contract on the private side with the CFO, we're in, through his silence, he's defaulted on our uh, statements no. and agreement that... No, you're, you're thinking debtor-creditor, no. and that's not the way to be thinking. Uh, you got to go back to the original signature. Now, where is your original signature? On the uh, note. Okay. So when was the note signed? 2005. Okay, now what is your trust res property? The note. No. Okay. Pardon? When was that transferred on a present transfer? Uh, that's also on the uh, notice of interest we filed. Okay, uh, notice of interest is just nothing more than going to evaporate within 30 days without the SOI. Okay, we're planning on following that up. All right, so now we're talking about trust res property being the note. So mm -hmm. when when did you transfer the note by say a delivery? Uh, at the closing. At the closing. Okay. So now we know when trust res property was transferred. Now I've got to do is prove that at that time that that specific trust res property was transferred. How are you going to do that? Well, we are going back and saying uh, we made a mistake at the time. We didn't express the trust, so we're doing it now. All right. So, but you remember that no party in the trust formation needs to know that a trust is being formed at the time it's being formed. So what is it that really sets the formation of the trust, which is at a present transfer of property, and how do you prove? In other words, what is one of the four methods of formation of a trust? Transfer. Transfer, okay. Now, how are you proving that you got a transfer? Well, I don't know. Okay, do you have a, a UCC-1 claiming it? Because the title would be the, the note, so you don't have to create a title because you already got a title. You just need to claim the title on a 1 and do the county recording so that you got the two records, so that you got two certified copies of the UCC-1 and the county recording notice. So now you got a claim. The big one comes in this the one two punch is the UCC three, which is gonna be the transfer record that shows that three years prior, whatever it was, that you transferred the trust res property at that particular time, and that's gonna be on the UCC three that you're gonna file now, after you've filed the ones. And then you're gonna get again the two records from the UCC one certified copy of the UCC three, I mean. And the notice you're going to put in the county, get that out certified. So now you got two records to prove your, your transfer. And if you did that by notary presentment, then you would also have an endorsement on a green card, which is one of the methods of under transfer. And you would also have a delivery of that green card, proving that delivery nunk pro tunk, say, three, five years earlier. And you also have under assignment UCC3 proving a transfer. So now you got some proof. You got two records of proof that there was a trust. That a trust was formed because you specifically transferred specific trust res property. And I'm sure that doesn't quite sound like what you're explaining to me on this contract you're talking about. Because it's not all about that contract. That you're going about that all wrong, I think. Basically, what you've explained okay. so far. Okay, I'd like to ask um, about the uh, claiming the title of the warranty deed, which is is not the warranty deed the uh, legal title. All right, now now you're talking about multiple trusts. Okay, they uh, we have a copy of the uh, warranty deed, and that's all we have. And so I don't know I how, what happened. How many trusts? How many trusts do you have in a mortgage foreclosure situ situation? Do you know? 
I assume there's three, the note, the mortgage, and the title, the warranty deed. Yeah, you're right. There are three. The county warranty deed is one. The case itself is another trust, and the escrow closing in the bank is all another one. So you got three separate trusts, three separate trusts, three separate processes, three separate merging of titles, you know. Well, we're in New Hampshire. They don't send us a uh, an invitation to court. So, how do we proceed on that? Great. You know how to do get them, get them in an action so that they don't have to invite them to court. So you win on a counterclaim. That's what I. Uh huh. That is what we're trying to do. And then the object. Is Let your counterclaim uh, a breach of trust, or claim a trust, and they don't come in and defend it. Then your trust stands. Well, I like it. That's what we're trying to do. I just thought we started the uh, con supposed contract process on the one side, and then um, as I learned about this trust information, it seemed like we had a double-barrel shotgun to work with. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we really do. Uh, but, you know, today, since we have no lawful money, there cannot be a contract. So if there's no contract, because we don't have lawful money, then there's got to be something else taking its place. And we really shouldn't be calling a contract. And what's taking its place is a trust, so we need to be calling it a trust. And then we need to know about trusts, you know, how to get the elements and the method so that we can come in and prove the trust, have that records, and, and uh, then we can go from there. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the uh, trustee, um, the bank, uh, would it be beneficial, do you think, to... Uh, keep them as the trustee and uh, direct them to disperse a portion of the funds to us for the time being until we figure out exactly, uh, you know, this is assuming that um, things go our way, obviously, over the next three months or so. Okay, what makes the uh, bank the uh, trustee? Pardon? What makes the bank the trustee? Uh, they were assigned uh, trustee, I believe. Okay, how did they get assigned trusteeship? from the uh, original mortgage lender? No. No, no. Uh, they, you gave them power of attorney in the bank, giving them power of attorney, your signature, appointed a title company to be trustee. I read on the case, we, you remember we were on early enough that I talked about that bankruptcy case? Let's see, where's yeah. that? Mitchell's? Uh, yeah, yeah, I believe it was. Uh, let's see, where's that? I have it here someplace. I lost it. <laughs> well, anyway, it was that Nevada bankruptcy case uh, where it said the, the statute. Oh, here it is. The statute under Nevada Revised Code statutes under 70, or one, oh, excuse me, 107.020 Nevada Revised Code statutes where it said that the maker of the note is the trustor and the payee is the beneficiary. And who is the payee on the note? The bank. The bank mm -hmm. beneficiary. You established by the note itself prima facie evidence that the bank, until further notice, is the beneficiary. So they knew they were the beneficiary, and they appointed by your power of attorney some other entity because they couldn't be trustee and beneficiary in one entity. So those being wise animals the way they are, Smart thinkers, they appointed some other separate entity to be the title company to be trustee per your appointment. Now, how have you revoked that uh, assignment, that appointment? Now, in other words, there's where you should be coming in with that contract under the 9-210 that you're kind of talking about, which is going to give you the ability to revoke the signatures on the power of attorney that gives you the right to do that so that you can come back in and set up a new assignment as the bank being the trustee. And until you've done that, you can't even do the assignment that the bank is the trustee. And you're going to do the assignment the same way that you did to the claiming and the transferring of the note into trust res property. If you don't have trustee well, at first, how can you assign the note to some trustee that doesn't exist yet? So you're all confused. The, uh, you got stuff out of sequence. Uh -huh. 
you got stuff that you're not doing right and you're not understanding the right thing. Not to be, you know, derogatory or come down on anybody, you know, but this is, this is kind of a, a good basic learning experience, not only just for you, but for everybody else really listening. I'm open to being learned, believe me. But um, it's kind of funny because the uh, third letter we sent to the CFO did uh, ask for a statement of account under UCC 9210. And my question was going to be, did we pollute that process mixing the private side contract with the public UCC reference? Mm, no, I, I don't think so. If you keep it for uh, what you're trying to do is get a dishonor that I can use as a, the right to make the claim that I can revoke the signatures on the on the uh, power attorney uh, power attorney appointment. Now I got a, a legal so, reasoning and a legal standing to revoke the signatures. So only giving them ten days to respond to the first letter um, is. Not a problem, do you think? Or no, because you well saying okay. this process is the debtor creditor anyway. So yeah, according to UCC, if I do an actual put that statute in there, nine dash two ten, and ask for a debt validation, basically it says that I'm supposed to give them fourteen days. Oh, uh -huh. Well, this was in the third letter. We didn't give them any uh, deadline. This was our uh, notice of default letter. Yeah. Well, I'm only using the nine dash two ten way as a means for giving. Uh, Getting them in a default, so I got a right to revoke the signatures, and then I can come back in and assign a new trustee from that. And then once I've assigned a new trustee, then I got some trustee that I can transfer trust res property to. If I don't have a trustee, I can't trust transfer any trustee property unless that bank I'm transferring that note to on the UCC one and three. And unless they have a, a trustee appointment, they're not trustee. And I've got it out of sequence. First, I need to appoint them trustee. And then the very next day, I'd transfer them trust res property. Okay. So a couple of Thank fundamental mistakes that really would be fatal. All right. I'll have to go back and listen to this again so I can get it. All right. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, send me an email if you got some more clarification. Okay. Thanks. Bye. So, uh, hey, uh, Christian, I'm uh, trying to find my uh, my host for the program tonight, Christian Walters, so we can probably take another uh question, and um, we've got one from Ty out there in uh, Colorado, Typhoon. Uh, I looked up, I looked that up, and there is what it says, NRS 107.020, transfers in trust of real property to secure obligation. Transfers in trust of any estate in real property may be made after March 29, 1927, to secure the performance of an obligation or the payment of any debt. This says nothing about who is the grantor or grant grantee. Can Christian post that particular section of the bankruptcy lawsuit? Well, the, all you got to do is go on the internet, probably do a Google, it'll pop right up. I, I gave the case number, and it's uh, footnote number 31. The case is... Uh, Henry Joshua and Stephanie Mitchell. You pull that right off the internet. And then check out footnote 31. Got another one, Desert? Uh, yeah, and then a follow-up with Typhoon. Uh, it is huge. So many documents, it would make your head swim. Which particular document is the case? Uh, let's see. Well, this is the this is the judge's uh, ruling. Uh, this is the entry on the docket on March thirty first, two thousand nine. This is signed by the judge, the bankruptcy judge. And in that case, the judge says that the the grantor or the the uh, trustor is the one who signs the note, and the bank is the beneficiary on the note, the payee. That's a that's a bankruptcy federal judge. And they're quoting the Nevada Revised Code Statutes 107.020. Another one? Okay. Uh, we got uh, a new listener. Looks like 408 area code. State your first name. Where are you calling from? Okay. It'll work this time. Uh, this is Daniel Ray in California. Hi. Right. Yeah, Dan, uh, uh, hit, six, hit six about three or four times, please. Okay, see if that helps. A little more, okay. please. Okay, I'll try to speak up. The uh, if we, if we're going to, 
a case here, a criminal case, if we are then being held as the trustee in that case, and yet we've never ever received a, a penny of benefit as trustee, would they not owe us at least seven years of back trustee wages? Of what, fiction debt money? <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be bad. The point is, is if, if we've never been paid as a trustee, uh, there's there's statutes and laws against uh, involuntary servitude, and they've they've construed that we are the trustee. Well, if that's right. the case, are we not entitled to, comp to payment yeah, as a trustee? But yeah, you're gonna have to prove that uh, that you are trustee, and you're gonna have to put a bill in for it. Okay. I think we can go back at least seven years. Dependent upon the indenture and the trust, whether or not the, the beneficiary, I mean, the trustee is, is even going to get any payment. If it wasn't specified, in well, the, he might not be getting any payment. But say, if, if you'd ever express it okay. a trust and there's no wording in the indenture that explains anything out, that just opens the door for them to construe it any way they want to. And they're going to construe it that you're the trustee, that you don't get payment, and you're liable for the whole ball of wax. And you're in breach of trustee duty. And that sounds like more how they're doing things today than anything else. Absolutely. But conceptually, no one should have to work without compensation. Because that's, that's slavery, and that's against the law. Yeah, but you signed up for it. You volunteered for it. I'll agree with you. There's no involuntary servitude in this country. But you can volunteer for slavery, and you have. You, sang, you signed up on a 1040 form appointing yourself trustee on that individual master file. You self-declared yeah. yourself to be trustee status. And then you yeah, have 45 years ago, I, I filled one of those out. Pardon, I didn't hear you. Okay, what? I just thought, yeah, 40-some years ago, I filled one of those out. Yeah, I know. It only takes one. They, they never forget. That's uh, okay. Uh, I just wanted, in the meantime, I, can, I guess I should at least put a claim in first for uh, salary. Uh, yeah, you're going to me as trustee, I need to get paid. Yeah, but is it per the, uh, the indenture of the trust uh, grantor? Can, can you even get paid? That's the problem. Yeah, well, okay. I the only thing I can do is bluff. Well, no, I wouldn't say bluff. I would start setting up evidence as to who I am. Because really, I'm, I'm grantor on the thing, and then one of the other parties, either be trustee position or change of status to beneficiary. So I'm going yes, to make a claim that there is a trust, but coming in and proving that trust then with the material fact, the SOIs. Yeah, I'm just a week or two behind uh, uh, a trial, so I've got to figure out pretty fast how I'm going to play this. Yeah, right. Uh, theoretically, theoretically, then I can go in and, uh, and claim the, uh, the, the bill, the presentment, so, so it's signed the back side and hand it back to them. Well, if you could do that under debt or creditor, uh, if you feel more comfortable with doing something like that, yeah. You know, that Otherwise, the alternative is, how do I, uh, you just told me, uh, how we return it to them. Yeah. But are you are trying to operate on a trust or you're trying to operate on a debt or creditor? I'm trying to, I'm trying to operate in the free, in the free air of society. <laughs> They want to stick me in jail for four years for a stupid thing. Well, remember, no, there is trust. There's no criminality. You stand there forming a trust, and then that's that's the problem. You know, that's the thing that's really truly amazing about the trust end of it. It was a trust all along. You didn't know. You didn't understand. But yet, that still doesn't get you out from the obligation that you're the trustee and you're there solely for a breach of trust. And the only thing that the judge wants to know is you're guilty already. And he wants to know when you're going to make a payment. Yeah. Okay, if I, accept, if I accept the charges, that means there's no real trial, because there's no controversy. Yeah, but that's that's debtor-creditor accepting the charges for value and returning it back, turning it into a payment okay. instrument and using that payment instrument, but under the discretion of the bankruptcy trustee who's going to have say so, whether or not you're going to have a set-off per his discretion, or a discharge per his discretion. And you're basically okay. at the whim of the court, whichever way they want to decide, but the throw of the dice, are you one of the one out of ten that gets the luck range that you go free, or are you the nine that goes to jail because you didn't make the payment? I don't like okay. having the mercy 
dependent upon some other party, not based on any kind of justice, because we're not in America any longer, but to be construed under admiralty and debtor creditor per the discretion of some trust that I didn't even know or understand was getting me, but yet that's how it's done, because I volunteered for it. Well, thank your Father in Heaven, at least you got, you got it now. Uh, yeah, because you still have an opportunity to go in and, and correct things, uh, get the evidence ready to support the material facts, to support the NOI, prove the trust, claim the trust. Yeah. Well, that's the first thing I, I need to file right now. I'm not quite there yet. I've got another week or two before it all comes down, but well, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not really, I go really and ready. I go and from November and December and January and start listening to them about as as uh, get a box yes. of fix and keep your eyes open so you can listen to them longer. Well, I, and I, I'm riding in the car. I listen to them all the time. Okay. Yeah. The the more, more we go over and over and over, and over it, it starts soaking in and it starts to become more clear. But we got to get over yeah, that better creditor thinking stuff in order to do the trust. I always come away inspired. I, I really appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate that you're sticking with it, and I, I wish you well and success. Oh, thank you, Christian. And uh, may you be blessed as well. Okay, uh, we'll take another uh, call. And we've got, um, looks like Rhonda in Missouri again. Come on, Rhonda. I'm like a bad habit, ain't I? Yeah, and let me just announce, because uh, uh, I know we've I've got my uh, host, I finally located him on the uh, program here, Frederick Earl Fred. Uh, uh, and uh, we, uh, he, he's still got to learn how to use his uh, communicator, his Skype, and uh, so we couldn't communicate on the uh, program here, and we were uh, we're running late. And then I've got I've got a guest coming over in 30 minutes, Fred. So we'll probably go ahead and cancel the uh, Starfire Chronicles for tonight and uh, pick it up tomorrow because it'll be hard to do a presentation with uh, uh, a new visitor over here, and um, and I should focus on have on my guest. So I'll probably do a pre-record. I'm going to pick out a special uh, Forbidden History. Uh, programming after Christian Walters. We'll stay on and answer a few more questions uh, and um, and try to help everybody out here. And then we'll pick up with Frederick Earl uh, uh, hosting the Starfire Chronicles with yours truly, Desert Owl, uh, next Saturday after Christian Walters. And we'll talk about the universe and all the uh, the things that are in it, including the words and the symbols and the metaphor. So I want to uh, thank Fred for, uh, for uh, coming by tonight, and we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Everything's just saying we need to... Uh, Try again next week for the uh, uh, with everything going on here. So uh, anyway, we're uh, Rhonda. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Rhonda. Go ahead. One one, one word for the fellow that was on there to last before you. Uh, you know, if, if somebody might want to take him under your wings, if you're in a group that you got room in your group that uh, you need somebody else, you know, you might want to maybe get a hold of this fellow or this fellow get a hold of them. You get under like a trust ambassador group or something. That would probably help him a lot. Yeah. So, hey, uh, before we go to Rhonda, there's Fred. Hey, Freddie, there? Uh, Come in, Fred. Frederick Earl, you there? <laughs> well, he, he unmuted, so I was going to just uh, introduce everybody to Fred real quick. Uh, Come in, Fred, are you there? Okay. Well, I, I guess uh, he's not on. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, Fred, Fred is a good friend of mine and actually was part responsible for getting me back in radio, and uh, he's did 10 years uh, or more of uh, Freedom's Questions out on public radio, actually on mainstream in California. And um, well, Do you know how to get a hold of him, Desert? Uh, and, well, uh, well, Fred's on. I think, Fred, are you there? Come in, Fred. Well, you know, he's got a, uh, they've got a wonderful following uh, out there in California, uh, Christian, and he listens to you uh, uh, very avidly, and they're telling people and their law groups out there about your work as well. So Fred has been a great supporter of our network. Every time uh, we have a need, he comes through, so I'm very honored to have him. And uh, we'll just uh, introduce everybody to Fred uh, next uh, uh, next week when we bring on the Starfire Chronicles. So, okay, uh, Rhonda, and, uh, go ahead. Hi, Christian. Uh, uh, Speak up. Please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, please be patient with me, Christian. All right. <laughs> I'm still. <laughs> I'm still. Let's go back to the Declaration of Independence again. I'm still right. trying to wrap my head around this. Okay. Now, let me just tell you how I view things. We talk about a master trust. Okay. First and foremost, I see the master trust, like you said, is with our our relationship with our Heavenly Father, right. which is a trust. Right. A relationship is a trust. 
and no Rhonda, doubt about Rhonda, it. Before you, go, before you go further, Rhonda, boost your audio some more. You're too low. You know, this is being recorded, and you're going to be way low on the recording, and, I, and I'm having trouble hearing you, so um, try to get everyone up to maximum, and that way we're all equalized. Go ahead, Rhonda. You're try it again. Is that better? Oh, yeah, definitely better. I try to boost it on my end, but sometimes it just doesn't work. I don't know, that Internet thing. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, we got that That I consider the ma our, my master trust is that relationship. And, yes, he's the grantor, the creator of everything. Uh, I see our Savior as uh, the trustee since he paid the bills. He paid the debts forward and backward. And us, the beneficiaries of that relationship, because we're his children. Even in, uh, we are the inheritors of our fa what our uh, of our father's estate. Okay. Then we come down to the Declaration of Independence, which was written by man, which was you know, because to be a grantor, I mean, these guys are expressing. They're the the way I see it is they was granting their rights and trust to, you know, it just occurred to me right before I got came back on was what you said earlier, our brother's keeper. Would a keeper not be a trustee? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, as far as the Declaration of Independence, the way I see it is men, our father's children are the grantor to that because now we're taking the, the benefits that he gave us and we're entrusting them into our brother's keeper as the trustee and to hold on to them for our benefit. So I see us as grantor beneficiary on the Declaration of Independence and our brother's keeper it maybe as the trustee. Because how can we really say that the Declaration of Independence, that our father was the, the grantor on that document? Because well, how do we know that it was signed by was, men? Was what was written, the Declaration of Independence, was not you know inspired by God to begin with, that God granted unalienable rights to all living beings that were humans. Right. I don't disagree with that a bit. He granted those rights to us, and we was, and we're his children. We're the beneficiaries to that. And oh, yeah, yeah. thanks to... I don't know whether or not I would classify myself as a beneficiary. Uh, I think God is doing everything for his own glory, for his own benefit. So he's glorifying himself. So he granted to a trustee, and I think the trustees are really us, for his own benefit. So I think God is grantor, uh, beneficiary on that. Okay. Uh, okay, I guess we're, I, I'm just seeing the Declaration of Independence as being an expression of what our Father gave us. I mean, doesn't it say in Scripture that we're his children and that when we grow up, uh, we, you know, <clears throat> just like any father's children would inherit their estate? Yeah. Uh, that yeah. We, I know what you're trying to point out. It's like, okay, uh, we're trying to get in a position of where when we sign that Declaration of Dependence as being, say, our acceptance of the trust, that we can put ourselves in that grantor position. So as a trustee on the private side, you can put yourself into a grantor position on the public mm -hmm. then because... Well, no, I'm saying the, I would be the signer, say, on the Declaration of Dependence, those 56, 57 signers, they, you know, they did an acceptance on that and... They could technically say under, you know, man's interpretation of the law, then uh, whoever signed it, that was the grantor on that document, even though it was gifted, say, by God. So Right. So this, the I signer do a, would or, be the grantor. So if I do a similar acceptance and become an allonge and sign on to it and attach it to it, then, you know, I could say, well, okay, I'm now a signer on that document. So I'm established myself, say, as grantor position, and then I got this the rights to, to appoint... So I could be co-grantor with God. There could be multiple grants. Okay. You know? So I'm acting as right. basically like his trustee for, and here I'm writing this document, but I'm going to say as to the, to, the, to the world, here's this document. I signed this document, and my acceptance on that is going to set me up as grantor. So okay, then as well, grantor, that, that I was my question. any other position. Go yeah, ahead. when you was talking earlier, when you were talking earlier about uh, us being that God was grantor and beneficiary and we was trustees, then I was wondering, okay, how do we have the, where do we have the right then to appoint ourselves grantor? Okay, from coming from so, God's point of view, I think God is grantor and beneficiary and we're trustees. Coming from our point of view, which is different from the other side now, 
where I could look at that as, okay, I'm going to grant my signature on that, make me the grantor, which gives me the position to set up the other parties. Okay, that that's what I had in mind that that our you know our intention was going to be. But then earlier when we was talking, because um, that's that's what I wanted to clarify is that okay, you know, as signers, you know, you are a grantor, then you you know you're expressing that trust as your trust. Right. I I think the whole point of view is relative from what side you're standing on. You know. So, but you know, I haven't. I think the point is to to be your brother's keeper. And that would glorify God, whichever position you want to construe it as from your point of view, from the side we're trying to do the interpretation from. Okay. I was just making sure we was on the same page there that we do want to be grantor as far as the Declaration of Independence is concerned. Uh, yeah, because I was expressing it, say, from God's point of view, from what I really thought that how he meant it to be from his point of view. Okay. That's, uh, that's the way I was thinking that, that uh, we, from our, you know, the shows earlier, that that's the position, but then earlier we was just talking about being trustee, and I was thinking, hmm, you know, if we're just trustee, how, what gives, then where do we have the right to, you know, do the grantor thing that, uh... I, I figured that was going to come up next. <laughs> okay, thanks. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a mind twist or a paradigm shift to throw out this duality of how these two worlds, you know, now you have to do your, you have to stretch your mind, and you have to think about, you know, okay, and then things are relative from your point of view, from what position you're trying to do the interpretation from. It's an exercise of the mind. But I think the point that really makes it fit is, okay, how am I glorifying God in what he says? That's what it really comes back down to. And it doesn't make any difference how I come through it, whether I set myself as grantor, as long as I am loving my brother and taking care of my brother, I think that's what's going to glorify God. Okay, sounds like okay, we've, we've got, uh, well, we could go a little further, uh, Christian. We've got uh, one from, uh, let's see, we got Shane standing by on Skype. Uh, let me see here, what's he got? Should I have accepted, uh, should I have accepted the judge is offer, and uh, since there is no controversy, and say have a nice day. I don't know what that's the beginning. I have a let me see. I have a question. Can I give it to you here? Okay. Okay. I will send it to you. No. Okay. I guess it's a short. Uh, this is it. Okay. Should I have accepted the judge's offer, and since they say no controversy, and say have a nice day? There is. Okay, he's got some. He sent me some document, but uh, I got all this stuff open on my desktop, and I can't. I can't open the document uh, to see what he's referring to. Well, I think Shane. I think it boils down to uh, what they say is one thing, but how are they acting is another. You know, if they say that there's no controversy, then how come they're still coming at you? So I would go by their actions because their actions going to overcontract what their words are. So, Your Honor, if you're going to say there's no controversy here, then why don't you just dismiss the case and uh, close it and we'll all go home. But if I put in a motion on the public side of the court, that would uh, do that. Is there a motion to dismiss in there? Okay. Uh, very good. Shane says he's on the phone, but I don't see uh, uh, Shane on the uh, line here with a hand up, so I can't I can't grab him. Uh, Shane, I don't know uh, what to do, but... Um uh, yeah, I, I've got too many things open up on my broadcast here to uh, uh, to uh, close it all out to find that document. I apologize. Um, let's go to uh, uh, next up, Dan, and uh, see we got Dan in California. Okay, can you still hear me? Or I need to fix it up. You're uh, you're pretty good. Uh, give it a shot, Dan. Go okay, ahead. okay, thank you. Uh, two things. Some have pondered this question and suggested that. Uh, the father set this up. Adam is the trustee, and 2,000 years ago, the descendant of Adam, Yeshua, became the trustee for the whole thing. So then the question is, where does that leave us as, uh, come to say, stewards under the trustee? Yeah. Well, here's another one nobody's ever thought of, I think, is uh, what if Christ was the trust res? Oh, that's interesting. Because that's how, how do you make a payment? You make a payment with the trust res. Oh boy, that'll that'll set my thoughts and processes. Mm -hmm. uh, second question: Did uh, anyone come up with a way?
way to contact Fred in California, either phone number, email, or anything else because of shortness of the time? Oh, no, I've, I'm uh, communicating with Fred uh, uh, through our engineer, and uh, we're going to be rescheduled for next week. Thanks, uh, Dan. Are you, Dan, uh, are you next week, Fred? I've, got a, I've got a court date in about three or four days, so uh, well, can I give you a n number to have him contact me? you need Fred to contact you? Yes, I like that. Or Okay. Uh, are you just wanting a contact in California? I'm not. I'm not clear. You know? Do you know well, Fred? If, if, no, I don't know Fred. But I like to uh, okay. have a contact with him. Well, sure. Well, contact me on the side. Uh, you know, like tomorrow. My phone number is on the website. Uh, go to contact page or archive on the realpublicradio.net and call me. I'll be glad to give you his number privately. Okay. Okay. Or else you can call me and I can do it openly. Well, I'll be glad to give it to him. If you want to email it to me on the contact page, uh, that'd be fine, Dan. Just put Dan from okay. California, please give Frederick Earl this uh, phone number. I'll be glad to pass it on. Okay. Just may want to say, Excellent. you know, what, what you're looking for. Fred's, Fred, Fred's a good guy, and uh, he's, uh, he's also been studying uh, a lot of this stuff. Excellent. Yeah. I've been doing this for over 40 years, and this is some of the best stuff I've run into in all that time. I'm also sometimes known as Dan the Seal Man. I go around designing sovereign seals for everybody. Oh, okay. No kidding. Okay. And I worked with most of the groups around the country and offered my services. I don't charge for it, but I drop uh, sovereign seals and email them up to people, and when they like it and everything's spelled right, then I just come forward to the manufacturer. That way it takes all the problems out of the middle. It works very, very well. Great. Yeah, well, pass your information on to me, and I'll keep it handy and refer you. I'll be glad to do it. Okay, Eric, I'll be glad to give the phone number over the air. It's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. Have everybody everybody calls me. Uh, You're welcome to give out, uh, It's 408-741-5555. Uh, five, five, zero, zero. Okay. And uh, that's, a, that's a Dan in, in California. Dan, uh, you, uh, Dan the Seal Man. Yes, the Sovereign you know, in, Ambassadors and stuff. We also you ran the common... Robert Kelly? Did you do those for Robert Kelly with the Americans Bulletin newspaper? No, I didn't do Robert's. Uh, I've done them for Sam Kennedy, I've done them for Keith Livingway, I've done them for oh, all different groups around the country. Because uh, we ran the uh, common law court in Las Vegas for several years. And we, got, we, were, and we had two-day seminars and uh, held common law court, got people introduced. But we, I, we knew that we didn't have a full answer, so I finally, about three years ago, I closed it down because it was helping, but it was not sufficient. Right. We're in, we're if you yeah, San Jose area. Okay, finish your thought. No, I'm just saying, if you, there's no saying that if you motivate and don't train, you frustrate. And people got all excited, ran out, tore the plates off their cars, and everyone got in trouble. Because we had a couple of missing pieces. Apparently from Christian, we've got a lot of missing pieces. But we were, we were at least it was part of the learning curve. And uh, anyway, a lot, of people, a lot of people around the country know of me. Again, I truly appreciate, I truly appreciate, uh, Christian's work. It's, uh, well, I could immediately, instantly, first time I heard him, I said, yes, 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 this is correct. <laughs> and thank you so much again. Thanks. Yeah, this, this trust stuff seems to make uh, everything jive to Gail, or the things that weren't, weren't dovetailing, it makes it fit. It seems to be the answer. Believe it or not, about eight or, believe it or not, eight or so years ago, we were, we were writing trust. We put together a, a trust package, some some trust private, some public, uh, protective trust, and everything else into a package that even kept the courts out by putting in buffer trust. So our thinking was on the right direction, but we didn't nearly have all the information that Christians got. At least we were we were at least somewhat familiar with some of the rules and terms. I was under the impression that you could never wear two hats at once as a grantor, beneficiary, or Whatever you had to wear one or the, one of the three, but usually one at a time. Yeah, you could be grant or beneficiary, or grant or trustee, uh, but not uh, right. Sorry, not not trustee and beneficiary in one entity, because that that would merge the titles. Yes, thank you for teaching us that. <laughs> the fact that it is not revocable. In fact, we can go back and correct it. That is the the greatest, largest piece you you've come up with. That is incredible. Yeah, because it's claim to go back and correct it because it wasn't my intent or purpose, which is uh, restatement of the seconds, uh, law and trust, uh, section 342. That's fantastic. It changes everything. Yeah, it does. Uh huh. Yeah, thanks.
I we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, Dan, thank you. And uh, just a program note, uh, we uh, are going to be doing a uh, interview. Fred, the last uh, interview Frederick Earl did with me, I brought him on as a special uh, guest and friend interviewer on uh, the network here a few months back. And so we'll be doing The Real Da Vinci Code, uh, The Occult Nature of Words, okay, which was the prelude to the dictionary that I'm doing right now. And uh, so that's what's coming up right after uh, Christian Walters here. We're happy to uh, have all of our friends from around the world on the network and uh, and uh, able to extend the programming tonight to take your questions. Uh, a lot of uh, great people come on here, and it's, an, uh, it's a real honor to meet them for the first time. Uh, we've got a, a new caller out there in the 530 area code. 530, state your name, and where are you calling from? Come in, 530. Okay, well, uh, going once, going twice. Five three zero. Okay, just uh, they're gonna listen in. I'll mute you back out, and uh, let's go one more and let's call it a night then. Oh, okay, we've got uh, Andrew in Maryland up next. Who's that? Andrew in Maryland. Are you there? Yeah, right here. Yeah, how you doing, okay, that, hit, uh, Andrew? Hit six about six times, and then uh, speak up, please. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, Andrew, yeah, go ahead. Or you're good there, Andrew. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, all right, Christian. Uh, I run with Andrew from Maryland. I'm going to ask you a question here. How would you uh, go about uh, getting all your um, friends that you work for by, back from Social Security? Is there some certain form you had to fill out or something like that? Or how am I going to do Social Security? I didn't quite catch that again. Yeah, how would you get all your, if you work, uh, you have Social Security, you want to get all your Social Security money back? Or all your funds back. How would you uh, go about doing that? Uh, the Social Security funds get back from all the work that I've done. Yeah. Uh, I think that's like the grain of sand compared to all the sand on all the beaches. I'm going after all the sand on all the beaches. <laughs> One particular grain of sand. <laughs> I'm going after. Uh, okay. You know, I, I don't think it's. Uh, for the amount of time involved in the hassles and all the work and stuff, uh, you know, it, it's not worth it to me just to go after the little grain of sand. I'm going after everything. Oh, okay. Cause I was, I was adding up everything I got back, and I was uh, for the total for the amount of years I worked, and I tried to find out how to get the total back at one time. That's what I was trying to figure out. Well, I have no idea how much money is in the account, but I know on the debt side it's probably, you know, 35 billion dollars or more, and once okay. that is set off and all the other unknown debts that I, that I have, then whatever is in that account on the asset side and the private side, I'm going to get that all back. And that's what I'm going for, the whole thing. Oh, okay. And that's going to yeah, be how about I go about doing that? In the 35 billion. Oh, okay. I'm trying to figure out how you do it through the trust or something like that, you know. Well, it's all done through trust, yeah. I'm going to terminate the straw man by merging the debt titles along with the asset titles, and that straw man account terminates, and I'm going to form another trust with the remainder that comes out of that private side, and I'm going to put the assets in there. Oh, okay. All right. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. I don't think we want to go without taking Dave in Florida, Christian. We better take him. <laughs> yeah, bring him on, yeah. Regular. Dave in Florida. Let me on you. Dave, come on down. Hey, hey, my friend. Dave, where are you at? <laughs> Florida, yeah, where's that? Between the A and the B, but... He's not here. That's where he is. Where have you been hiding, oh, Dave? Thank you so much. Well, I haven't been hiding. I've been listening every week, but uh, I just like to hear a lot of other people ask their fabulous questions, and we had some really good ones tonight. In fact, uh, my only question is, uh, I was going to ask Desert if he would repeat how we can obtain the recording of tonight's broadcast or call uh, tomorrow from his, is it his website or someplace? Well, if you wait long enough, you can get off time. Yeah. You can get it either from Christian or from us, either one. Uh, yeah, well, what? We, uh, okay. Make available, uh, we make it available, to, uh, you know, through our network. If you go to the archive page, the instructions are there, and, uh, and it will be available in the morning. Uh, uh, but it's a matter of... Uh, you know, if you you know, uh, Christian and I are both, uh, you know, needing needing support. So it really doesn't matter wherever you're inclined to, uh, to, to to get the audio, or you can go back and forth each week. You know, um, 
but uh, it's all explained on the archive page and will be available starting tomorrow morning. But we've also got an urgent tab up there, and we can send you an email with some very powerful uh, uh, work that we're doing with our dictionary and our translations as well for any size. You know, we bring we give it to you for any size donation if we can click it to you. If we don't have to pack an envelope or put it in the mail, uh, we can click a button. That's what we're trying to do. So uh, thanks for that, Dave. Well, my follow-up question would be, uh, Christian, I signed up for the workshop with the application and all, but I never got the application. So I know you, maybe you're behind on that, but uh, what can I do? What else can I do? Send the third request? Just, no, no, I, I've got your two requests. They're in the, the, the request folder. And when I get done writing the, uh, the instrument, then I'll, I'll send out the application. I just haven't finished it yet, that's all. Just please. Okay. Well, you're a sweetheart. We love you, man. And uh, I'll sign off. Thank you so much. Just, just be patient. You know, I, I got them. Just haven't, haven't finished it yet. All right. Well, good job. Good, really great call tonight. Sure, you don't have another question? Great. Well, I. <laughs> we had to, uh, I know you. I know you have one in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, all your calls, uh, just about every question has been answered on them. I mean, the only thing would be less maybe a specific call to specific situations, and, and uh, it's been a long night for you. And I'll just I'll just wait for your next call. That's fine. Okay. I love you guys. You're the best. And I wanted to welcome my new friend Mark. He's listening for the first time, and he's going like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He used to be a paralegal and works for some really great names out there, like Richard Cornforth and Dan Meter. And uh, he's just all new to him, so. Uh, hi, Mark. Hope you're doing great. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Desert. Well, I hope you get really the, uh, the, effort. the downloads that you've listened to. Uh, you, you're shooting them to him, so I get him up to speed. No, I edited them out, so it cuts down on the time a little bit. But uh, uh, I, I missed the one on Tuesday because I wrote the number down wrong. But uh, I, I see that's up. I can go the one on Tuesday, the 26th. Mm hmm. That's the one I wanted to get. Plus tonight, tonight, there was a gentleman on tonight that asked some really good questions. He, I mean, he, he's in a process where he's, he's got a pretty good handle on it, but you answered some of his specific questions really, really well. Okay. Hey, Dave, thank you. Uh, we've got, uh, 716 area code to try to jump in. Do you have a, a question, area code 716? Yes, you know, Desert? Yeah, who's this? This is Shane. I just, I, I just finally figured out how to raise my hand after about three hours. Okay, Shane. Yeah, star five will raise your hand and uh, come on down. Yep. How are you doing? Good, good. Just only take a second. I just want to have Christian hear this. That, yep. uh, Shane, that, I'm going to key you in. I know you in the future. What, where, are you, where are you located? What state? Um, New York. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Yeah, all right, great. Um, this goes on page nine, Desert, um, that I just sent to you. It just says, this is me at the end of the hearing. It just says, uh, Judge, <clears throat> again, I come here as a friend of the court. I just wanted to make a record of it. I just got a review of the Jenks report on this particular case. I see no controversy present in front of the court. And I said, thank you. And then at the end, the judge says here, uh, he says, all right. Um, he did say, Mr. Buchek, I understand. And that was that concluded the hearing. I didn't know what to say when I was trying to say on Skype is um, at the time, I didn't know what to say. But my thoughts is probably I should have said something by I accept your offer since there is no controversy. This concludes this case. Thank you. Have a nice day. And, um, you know, ask them if you wanted the ankle bracelet back or not. But that's where, that's what I was trying to get across, Desert. Yeah. Okay. Now you're so, the multi <laughs> yeah, that was my only question. I didn't know really what to say at the end, but <clears throat> I'm learning as we go along. Yeah, I would have taken on that case when you put that motion in on the for motion for forgiveness. Uh, that should have been put on the held on the private side, and then I would have. Uh, that 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 forgiveness motion is really for the real man, and then the real man only has substantive rights in the in the in chambers. So when you put that in the pro public side of the court, uh, that's the fiction side, and the fiction side, the fiction doesn't have forgiveness available to him. That's that. I, that's I saw what the problem was. Hey, Christian. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was a good month and a half ago. We, we already passed that point. Um, I did put uh, a private uh, 
motion in and a private order to dismiss this case, and I gave it to the public defender, and he sent me a letter back stating he can't do any of this, and uh, which was quite fascinating. Um, he says he's only getting prepared for trial. And I says, how do you get prepared for trial when the ratification, the commencement, has not been met? And we don't even know who has a claim against me. We have no, uh, you know, bona fide claim. And he and he says what he says all the time. I have I don't understand what you're talking about. So he does not agree. Mm -hmm. Doesn't understand. Either he understands and he doesn't really understand. Maybe I said or he under psych evaluation. Yeah. But what was fascinating is um, the attention I got after I filed my civil rights suit a couple months ago, well actually it's been not a couple months, month and a half ago, Christian. A lot of attention now. Now the trial's been postponed, the date's been moved around, and and uh, I'm at the point where um, I am uh, preparing some documents um, that I want to be heard on the private side of the case. Now, but, uh, if you throw um, something on the colorable side, there's some kind of a, a colorable counterclaim, like you, like you said there. Uh, now you're starting to take it to their their roof, and now you're going to put them with a little bit of pressure to, to maybe close this thing down. Yeah. Well, that was the next question. You already answered it. That's that's what I was going to ask you real quick, because I was thinking about removing the public pretenders, and I do have a counterclaim ready to go. And uh, so that, that's about it. I think you already answered my question, so that would probably be the, the best way to go. So, thanks, Christian. I think trust. I had him under trust, though. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, Shane. Thanks, guys. All right. I'm tired, guys, so let's close it out. Okay, Christian. Uh, very good. We I think we, we did enough damage for one night. Unless uh, we got a new call, or do you want to take a new call? Something quick, maybe. Yeah. Okay. We got uh, 574 area code. Stage first name. Where are you calling from, please? Hello. Yeah, you're going to have to turn that background noise off and uh, and uh, to hit this a few times, please. And yeah. Where is the stage first name? Where are you calling from? Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you better. You got the background noise, though. Uh, yeah, What's there we go. Uh, John in Indiana. Good to have you, John. Yeah, uh, you were talking about Christ as the trust rose. Maybe the blood is the trust rose. And Christ is the son, right? And he uh, gets the inheritance. So would that be the beneficiary? And we take part in the inheritance? Well, I think it comes from the point of view of who's trying to get the glory, because uh, man is always trying to glorify himself and get the glory. Uh, and I think it's the other way around. I think God deserves the glory. So I think God is doing everything right. for his own benefit. Right. So God would be the beneficiary. I believe so. That's right. the way I'm going to stick with mine, the way I interpret that. Mm -hmm. I think that puts God on the seat and keeps man off of it. Right. And the life is in the blood. That Christ came to earth to give uh, forgiveness and love to uh, the people on earth. God came to earth to fulfill the uh, Father's wishes to glorify the Father. And we happen to be the, uh, the benefactors of that. We are benefiting from that, but, you know, it's in a secondary position. Right. All right, thank you. Well, let's call it a night. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks for your call, John, and uh, everybody out there around the world. Good to, good to have you all tuning in and uh, telling your friends about uh, Christian Walters right here uh, every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Christian, uh, closing thoughts? Uh, check from the website, oh, movingtitles.com. So, um, subject to update that with new information at any time through the week, so... Check out uh, NT Hold on the website. We had Christian we got. Uh, no. Hold on. Can you, am I, am I, is my audio low or what? Can you hear me? Yeah. Is my, okay. I don't know. Sometimes I try to talk. I can't. I can't get in on my own program. <laughs> but I had. I we have one uh, friend out there, grantor beneficiary, 
and uh, and he was he was supposed to uh, he wanted to share some. There's some Skype groups that are that are following you, and he had something. Uh, uh, he said he was going to come on to uh, just share that bit of information because uh, he wanted me to announce it or whatever, and I didn't I didn't know anything about it. Uh, it was like Graner Beneficiary. Are you there, uh, Graner? Tuning in. Okay. Uh, well, maybe we can do it next week. Uh, I, I recommend. Uh, you know, rather than have me try to announce something, uh, you know, that I don't understand. Uh, okay, where he's giving me the, the pencil right now. Okay, uh, Ch- uh, uh One. Uh, there's apparently a Skype group. Are you familiar with any of the Skype groups out there, Kristen? Oh yeah, I talked to Pete. Yeah. He says they got any on. Yep. Okay. You know who who this is? Yes. Uh, yeah, I know him. Okay. C. Okay. C H I K M O N K I. That that's his Skype panel. Number one, that's the Skype panel, right? Uh, add, just add, try, uh, i tell you what, a, uh, to put it, tell you, here's what you do, uh, grant your benef- uh, beneficiary, put it on our, our chat page, okay? If anybody wants to grab it, put it on the chat page. That's the place to put, you know, uh, your announcement or whatever. Go to our chat, uh, and, uh, put it, yeah, that's where you do. Click on, you go to, uh, the opening page of therealpublicradio.net. You look in the top right, you'll see chat room. Click on chat room. And then just post it right there, and anybody can go there and grab it. That's the way to do it. That's what I was trying to tell everybody at the beginning of the program here, that we have a chat room. And if you want to get to know each other and share your information, you can do it right there. And that way, uh, it just makes it a lot easier because uh, we are it's a community. You know, it, it definitely is, and everybody wants to, to touch base. So good to have you, and, uh, and thanks for doing that. Okay, anybody, just go to the chat room and, and ch- check out one of our uh, fellow Americans out there trying to Make it a better world. Okay, Christian, final thoughts. Now you can have the floor. Uh, that's about it. Just keep checking on the website, movingtitles.com, all through the week there. And uh, do trust technology. And those pages, right? What about the pages? I didn't hear. Say what? I didn't hear you. What was that? I said, and keep turning those pages, right? Yeah, right. I'll be coming out with a new page. Yeah. And that means page. Pretty shortly. You broke up when you said that entire uh, statement. Say it again, Christian. I, I say I'll probably be changing the second main page to a second page, and where, where the audios uh, uh, links will be. Okay. All right. Well, see you all next Saturday, or we'll see you on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Sounds sounds good. We'll uh, see you then. Don't forget, everybody. You can hear Christian Walters right here every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Money, Banking, and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce, your solutions-oriented program on public policies, EYA, BIC, UCC.